We begin tonight by remembering the tragic passing of two Western Connecticut State University students. Uh, they passed away in an accident last Friday. Jacob Jake Chapman, um, as well as his dear friend Tyler Graham. This is Election Connection, WCSU live news and election coverage for 2021. I'm Jacob Schultz. We're streaming live over YouTube, WCSU Election Connection, and wcsu.edu forward slash live. You can also hear our live coverage over WXCI-91.7 FM and tweet us at ElectionCT. Joining me tonight is Professor Jackie Gusta. Hey, hi, Jacob. Uh, thanks for having me. Of course. Now, Dr. Gusta, we have a full show tonight covering local races and discussing issues important to Connecticut. Oh, we certainly do, Jacob. Uh, we'll start off with Jennifer Fajardo at the board. Jennifer, give us the rundown on the races we're covering tonight. Thank you, Dr. Gusta. We'll begin by looking at the mayoral races. In Danbury, we have Democratic candidate Roberto Alves. His challenger is Republican candidate Dean Esposito. In Stanford, we are looking at Democratic candidate and former state representative Caroline Simmons. Her unaffiliated challenger is Bobby Valentine. In Hamden, we have Democrat Lauren Garrett, former member of the town council, and Ron Gambardello, who previously ran for mayor back in 2007 and 2009. Over in West Haven, we have incumbent mayor Nancy Rossi, who is running for a third term, and we have Republican Barry Lee Cohen. In New Britain, we have Democrat candidate Bobby Sanchez running against incumbent mayor Aaron Stewart, who is seeking a fifth term. And in New Milford, we have Democratic candidate and lifelong resident Ted Hine running against incumbent mayor Pete Ross, who is seeking a third term. Another important election we will be covering tonight is Brookfield's first selectman race. We have Democrat Steve Dunn, who is the former selectman running for a fourth term. His ticket was endorsed by the town Democratic Committee. We have Republican Tara Carr, who is a 25-year military veteran running for office for the first time. And we have independent Austin Montero, who is also running for office for the first time. He was not endorsed by any party at this race. We will be updating you throughout the night as you receive votes. For now, back to you, Jacob. Thanks so much for the updates there. Jennifer, really looking forward to coming back to those races and seeing how they develop overnight. But yes, we do have quite a few interesting topics to talk about here. Uh, first off, we're going to be discussing infrastructure, but after that, we will touch on living with COVID-19 in Danbury, Connecticut, and nationwide, as well as political extremism and many others. So to start us off, we'll be going to a story on infrastructure in Connecticut. Let's take a look. Connecticut has been having infrastructure issues. Recently, there have been some constructions that have been happening in the Danbury area that have been taking years, especially on Newtown Road. Connecticut should soon see many more construction projects to come along as soon as President Joe Biden's $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan could transform Connecticut. President Joe Biden's infrastructure plan will be the largest in American history. This plan is designed to fix the nation's crumbling roads, bridges, and railroads while kickstarting the economy at a time when many Americans are still out of work. Some plans that will come to Connecticut would be widening I-84 between exits 3 and 8 in Danbury, I-95 corridor improvements from New Haven to New York, improving the interchange at Route 7 and 15 in Norwalk, upgrading the I-84 Route 8 interchange in Waterbury, improving I-95 near the highly congested exit 7 to 8 near downtown Stanford, repairing the northbound side of the Golden Star Bridge in New London, improving the congested interchange of I-91, I-691, Route 15 in Meriden, designed the removal of much criticized traffic signal on Route 9 in Middleton, and many more. Some hope that the plan will help with many problems that are dealt with now that the citizens of Connecticut are complaining about. With our weak infrastructure as 70% of our bridges are over 50 years old, the long-standing complaints about congestion on I-95 in Fairfield County, the proposed tunnel to improve the I-84, I-91 interchange in Hartford, and better street signs for the pedestrians who casually walk on the street. There have been many injuries in the past couple months that involve a four-year-old boy who has been seriously injured after getting struck by a vehicle in Owen Lyme, 
who has been rushed to the hospital. Also, two children that were seriously injured after being hit by a car in Torrington while they were riding their scooters at night. With the new plans to come to Connecticut, we are expecting some major changes to the infrastructure soon and maybe better road designs for the safety of the drivers and the pedestrians that walk the streets. This is Gabriel Ortiz, WCSU, Election Connection. Now, as we just heard there, infrastructure is an incredibly important issue to Connecticut voters. An infusion of $5.4 billion of federal funds for Connecticut roads, bridges, and other infrastructure is placing renewed pressure on the state's transportation department, which construction operators say has been slow to proceed on projects already in the pipeline. Connecticut needs this money. The state's transportation system is aging and overcrowded in need of repairs and enhancements. For years, state spending has only managed to maintain the average condition of roads, bridges, and rail lines, not improve it. Now, it's worth noting that Governor Ned Lamont is applauding President Joe Biden, Senator Richard Blumenthal, Senator Chris Murphy, and a bipartisan coalition of United States senators for passing the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This historic legislation will make the largest investment in United States infrastructure in decades, and its nonpartisan support is very, very, uh, I, I would say it's a good sign. It's something that we can certainly look forward to, uh, as we have a lot of polarization right now in American politics today. Well, look, Connecticut is going to greatly benefit from this bill. This has been Chris Murphy's baby for a long time. Right. Why? Because I would say just yesterday it took me two hours to get here when it used to take me one hour on a normal day. I mean, you know, as the package showed you, the entire state of Connecticut essentially is crumbling. And this is going to really put a dent in our economy if we keep things going on this way. Um, it's just, it's keeping, it's keeping us uh, in our homes and not getting to work on time. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be done to improve our transportation system, not only the roads, but the railroads also. So we need, you said it, we need this money. And I think that bipartisan-wise, Republican and Democrat agree in the state of Connecticut on this. Absolutely. And another thing that's very interesting is that this bill contains quite a bit of climate change and environmental procedures. Uh, the goal of this bill, or at least one of the goals of this bill, is to enhance the reliability of our energy grid. Anyone who's lived through a winter storm in Connecticut knows that that's a oh. big concern. And as well, uh, along with that, to accelerate the transition to cleaner forms of power and energy, which is a, a global initiative right now, really. Well, you just scared me with the idea of snow, because right now we want to go to Eric with the weather. Eric, take it away. It's been a mostly cloudy and chilly day for today, and those temperatures will actually those chilly temperatures will stick around. In fact, it's going to get downright cold tonight. We could potentially have our first freeze up the season tonight, and not certainly by another point in the week, as that chill does stick around for the remainder of the week. And we have a potential coastal storm that could be moving into the area, but it's not likely, and I'll get to why in just a bit. We do have frost advisors and freeze warnings by the National Weather Service. There, Danbury is within the freeze warning. So, because we expect temperatures to get around 32 degrees. Right now, though, temperatures aren't too bad. 49 stores, 53 in Hartford, 51 in Danbury, and New York City being 49. So it's certainly not that bad, but temperatures will certainly take a plummet as we go throughout the night. We have a dip in the jet stream in the northeast and Great Lakes region. That's what's causing those chilly conditions in the area. And off to the west, we do have much warmer weather, but because of this pattern, we are dealing with those chilly temperatures. And again, it'll get downright cold tonight. Our infrared satellite picture does show a bit of cloud cover in the northeast region and some clouds just to the northwest of us. That is in association with cold air going over the warm Great Lakes causing those clouds. And we take a broader view. There's those clouds of the Great Lakes region. And just looking off to the southwest, we do have more clear skies, which will work its way into the region by tomorrow. And then take a look at the entire country. We do see that Clear, those clear skies just off to the west, but then further to the west in the Midwest, we do have this, this mass of clouds, which is in association with a low pressure system, and that's actually developing some rain and showers. There it is right there. And this activity is actually going to move into the Gulf, and by the weekend, it will actually develop 
a low pressure system and two of them along the east coast. It will get close to us, but it will not affect us, and I'll show you why. So here's as of Thursday night into Friday morning. We have this area of low pressure here, but then just looking off to the west of that, we do have high pressure centered in the northeast, so that will keep that storm system away from us. A storm system on Sunday could actually get closer to the region as we do have a center of low pressure just off to the south, but that, oh, excuse me, high pressure in the south, but that high pressure will dominate a lot of the eastern portion of the country, so it does look like that we are going to stay dry and dodge a bullet with this storm, but I'll certainly keep you updated as we go throughout the night. Here's the latest fall foliage report. Danbury is when, within moderate colors. Sooner or later, we're going to get it to peak, and before you know it, we are going to be past peak. So if you do plan on doing any leaf peeping, be sure to be aware of that. Tonight, we have low of 33 degrees with that freeze warning in effect from 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. tonight. So very cold tonight. Tomorrow, it won't get too warm. In fact, we could struggle to get to 50 degrees tomorrow. High 49 with AM frost left over. Chilly with mostly sunny skies. At least we have that to enjoy. But then Wednesday night, again, 32 degrees. Very cold. We could be flirting with that freezing mark with mostly clear skies and calm winds. So it will certainly help temperatures get to be chillier with that. Extended forecast shows Wednesday, Thursday, mostly to partly sunny skies, but 49 and 48. So Really chilly Friday, 49 degrees. Saturday, we may reach that 50 degree mark with mostly sunny skies and probably sunny on Sunday with 51 degrees. So as of now, we do look dry for the weekend, but things can change. I'll update you as we go throughout the night. Back to you guys. Well, thank you so much for the weather updates there, Eric. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, and of course, something that we do need to keep an eye on as weather has a large effect on all of our lives, whether it be our commutes, recreational activities, anything else along those lines. But also, people should know to bring their puppies and kitties in tonight because it's getting <laughs> close to freezing. Absolutely, unless you have a husky. Um, We'll be going now to a field reporter, uh, Kathleen Dowling. She's going to be giving us uh, some updates on Danbury races. Uh, specifically, we really want to look at tonight uh, the contention for governor of Danbury. Um, our two challengers coming up here tonight are, uh, first off, we have uh, Roberto Alms, and his challenger is Dean Esposito, the Republican. Be very, very interesting to see who wins and who comes out on top tonight. So we're going to be going to Cat Dowling in the field now. Let's go to the field. Hello. Hello. Starting live from the Palace Theater in Danbury, which is right next to the Democratic headquarters in Danbury. Um, for a quick overview of the election, Dean Esposito, the Republican candidate, formerly served as town clerk and held the title Director of Consumer Protection and Sealer of Weights under Mayor Boughton, and also served as Boughton's Chief of Staff. Um, he ran for mayor in 2005, and his family has served Danbury in local politics and has said that he has it in his blood, as well as him being from Danbury. Um, Roberto Alves. Roberto Alves is serving his first term as a city council member and emigrated to Danbury from Brazil when he was five. He's expressed plans to protect immigrant population in the event of his election. He's criticized the previous administration's treatment of immigrants as well as the underfunding of schools. And he has stated that the city has been stagnant under the city's same Republican leadership for too long. Well, thanks so much, Kat. Now, could you shed some light on how partisanship will play a role in this race? So, um, Dean Esposito was under Mayor Boughton, and bipartisanship was a huge part of Boughton's administration. So, as um, Esposito has taken on the title of being a Republican um, this election, he, there, this is a new move for partisanship for the city of Danbury. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Kat. Uh, we really do appreciate all of your updates and information that you've given us, uh, and we're really looking forward to coming back to you throughout the night to see how these races develop. Thank you very much, Jacob. Of course. So next up uh, on the docket for tonight, we're going to be heading into a discussion and a story about the Facebook um, uh, situation that's been going on right now, developing even in Congress, um, and also ransomware attacks across the United States. As the number and severity of cyber and ransomware attacks increase, um, we are seeing uh, a massive number, over 1,000 according to the FBI, ransomware attacks within the last half of 2021. 
And it's something that is a new threat to national security and to individuals uh, as a whole. And it's, uh, it, it is a concern, uh, and it's something that we really do need to keep an eye on as we move forward into this next year. Well, you know, I remember, I think it was around 2012, I did a story about some ransomware. And it was actually the United States attacking Iran yeah. because the United States shut down Iran's nuclear program by, very simple act, leaving uh, a flash drive on a countertop. And some young engineer picked it up, wanted to know what was in it, and stuck it in and for three days. Absolutely. The Stuxnet virus took over Iran's nuclear program. So it's been around a while. At the time, I thought this is the new America's warfare. But as we can see now, it's America. It's also other countries who are doing it to us. But it is a huge problem. Absolutely. And uh, according to Cognite Cyber Threat Intelligence Research Group, um, the number of ransomware attacks nearly doubled in the first half of 2021. According to their research, mm. uh, over 1,000, nearly 1,200 organizations were hit by ransomware attacks in the first half of 2021. In contrast to this, their 2020 report found um, just over 1,000 ransomware attacks for the entire year. So we're seeing double the amount in the first half of the year, right, when compared so, to last year. So am I right? Is this a new type of warfare? Absolutely. I, I think it's safe to say it is. We're seeing now the world turning in a virtual direction mm -hmm. uh, in, in many ways. Uh, COVID spurred a lot of that, but it was happening beforehand. Yeah. Right? And a huge part of this will come from the military industrial complex and, and intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies slowly turning to look at how they can use virtual means, technological means to prevent things like these attacks from happening and to allow them to fight crime and other things like that better. Well, sure. And uh, look what just happened at Facebook last week. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, talk about interconnection. Facebook interconnects this entire world now. And Francis Hagen, who was the whistleblower, came out and said, hey, Facebook is not really making this a better world. You, right. Well, one of her main points was that the Facebook algorithms were actually pushing people towards extremism. And extremism is something that we're going to talk about later in the show tonight. Uh, but it all affects us. We're all wholeheartedly aware of it, right, that America has uh, scarcely been more divided than we are now politically. And she testified, Frances Hagen testified on October 5th, I believe, that uh, Facebook algorithms were, were pushing people um, further away from each other uh, just because it got more clicks, it got more views. And got what does Facebook get? More money. More money. Right. Not that they're the only ones doing that, but their influence is so pervasive. I mean, I've got, uh, I've got a quote from an employee who was anonymous saying, We've been, after January 6th, they sure. knew things were hitting the fans. So they said, we've been fueling this fire for a long time, and we shouldn't be surprised that it's out of control. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's fueling the fire. That's, uh, that's pretty clear right there. They knew. Yeah, absolutely. Of, of course they knew. And, and it does, you know, go in both directions. There is political extremism on, on both sides, for sure. Um, but it seems to be something that Facebook does not want to really put a damper on, or at least they didn't up until now. $900 billion profit last right. year? Right. I mean, uh, they probably don't want anything to get in the way of that. And it's, sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that uh, it, it needs to have, uh, you know, it, 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 we need to take a look at that right? well, and, where, and figure out where the line is, I guess you'd say. $900 billion is an astounding amount of money, but they also didn't want anyone to mess with them. Right. Um, they have this thing called X-Check where they would check out who was uh, criticizing them, and they yeah. would not criticize back influential people. And they said, never tangle with anyone who is influential, influ influential enough to do you harm. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, it's actually funny that you mentioned that. Uh, today, actually, uh, Facebook announced that they would be getting rid of a, a large archive of facial recognition software mm -hmm. and and uh, you know identities that they'd gathered within the last couple of years, which is uh, terrifying to me, you know, and, and, and because 
I don't think a lot of people knew that they were signing up for that when they signed up for Facebook. So it's something that requires transparency and probably a little bit more regulation. But we're going to be going now to a story uh, regarding big tech and ransomware. So let's take a look. On March 20th, 2021, a ransomware attack disabled DMV emissions testing in eight states, including Connecticut. Testing would not be restored until nearly a month later. Smaller incidents like these may not make national news, but ransomware attacks of all sizes have only increased since the Colonial Pipeline attack earlier this year. Security analytics firm Cognite noted that 2021 is on track to double the number of attacks from last year. Connecticut alone suffered at least four attacks in 2020. Notable victims included Pitney Bowes, Hartford Public Schools, and Griffin Hospital in Derby. But why ransomware? And why now? Traditionally, hackers gained access to a system in order to directly steal information like bank accounts, passwords, or social security numbers. But in a ransomware attack, criminals opt to seal away the whole hacked system, making it inaccessible even to themselves, demanding a high price in exchange for the key. But of course, these hackers do not accept physical cash or even traditional money at all. Cryptocurrency is their coinage of choice. It's nearly untraceable nature, in part fueling the surge of attacks. And it's not just frequency. Hackers are more confident and brutal in their tactics than ever. Hospitals are frequently the targets of choice, as they're much more likely to pay to resume life-saving services, particularly in the age of COVID-19. Ransomware is now so prominent that even President Biden addressed his concerns at the recent cybersecurity summit in D.C., stating that cybersecurity is a, quote, core national security challenge. Additionally, several major tech corporations, such as Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, agreed to help fight against ransomware in a rare joint effort. The Joint Cyber Defense Collaboration is a new initiative by the DHS whose goal is to share awareness of new cyber threats and to develop real plans to defend the nation in cyberspace. And while corporations battle cybercrime on a national scale, individual states have started enacting measures of their own. Connecticut recently passed Public Act No. 21119, which incentivizes businesses to adopt modern cybersecurity standards. In addition, Public Act No. 2159 passed as an upgrade to our existing data breach laws. However, these were not the only cybersecurity bills to reach the state floor this year. Five others were proposed, and all failed to pass. Connecticut is disproportionately targeted by ransomware hackers. Per capita, we are the third most affected state. Our largest industries may account for why we're under attack. Healthcare and education rank among the most targeted by ransomware globally. Whether local legislature or the nation at large has done enough to combat this ever-growing threat remains to be seen. This is Nicole Spazial for WCSU News Election Connection. Great story there relating to ransomware and other cybersecurity threats. It's something that has a massive impact on our way of life. Many people don't quite realize this, but it, there is a military threat uh, from cybersecurity threats globally. Countries like China have it out for us and, and certainly would love to see the U.S. brought to its knees by a severe cyber attack, the likes of which we need to be prepared for. Also, for our viewers, I just want to remind you that there is a viewing party currently for those of you who are Western Connecticut State University students. Um, it is on the West Side campus in room 218, I believe. If you go there, you can actually watch us live on the big screen. And there's free food. There is free food, which should attract quite a few people. Uh, but we're going to be going now to our field team. Uh, we have up next Brendan Castro, uh, who's going to be giving us some updates on the new Britain races. So let's go to the field. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, we're out here at the watch party uh, updating you on New Britain. So in New Britain, we have Democratic uh, candidate Bobby Sanchez. He represents New Britain in the General Assembly. He's also the chair of the Education Committee. He's very community oriented. He wants to improve New Britain's school system, include more of the town when he's focusing on economic development. And he also wants to help small businesses recover from the pandemic, which we all know is something that is very well needed right now. Uh, and he is against Republican Aaron Stewart, who's the incumbent mayor 
She's a self-described moderate Republican and typically leans off on social issues, and which makes sense because she's New Britain's youngest mayor. Uh, she's boosted the city's credit rating, brought New Britain beats to town after their former baseball team, the Rockcats, left, and she began her political career in the Board of Ed. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. Really, really appreciate that uh, and all that information from you. Now, New Britain schools have ranked in the bottom 50% of Connecticut schools. What have the candidates in New Britain said about this issue? We have a quote from Bobby Sanchez who claims, quote, the current administration has failed time and time again, focusing on blaming students and teachers rather than taking responsibility for failed policies and underfunding. Uh, we have no recent statement from Aaron Sewer on the matter, but we can assume that since she began her career in the Board of Education that she as well shares a, uh, an, an investment in improving it. Of course. Well, thanks so much, Brendan. Really, really do appreciate that, as I said. And we're going to be coming back to you throughout the night for some more updates on the New Britain race to see how the numbers develop. All right. All right. Thank you. Next up, we're going to be discussing the impact of the United States Census on our electoral process. Uh, in the 2020 election, uh, Texas gained two votes in Congress and the Electoral College for the next decade. And Colorado, Florida, Montana, North Carolina, and Oregon each gained one seat. Seven states, however, lost seats, those being California, Illinois, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Now, this trend of changing demographics influencing elections, this is nothing new to America, but it is certainly reaching its peak now, right? We're seeing uh, the the white demographic in America start to decline as other groups uh, begin to increase in size and number, and that is having an effect on our voting uh, uh, system here in America. And also, when it comes to the number of people in different states, that is a market effect on voting as well as we just saw from the census. Yeah, well, there's a number of different things going on. Is that, I think it is, what, uh, 2035? whites will become a minority right. in the United States. So we have a lot of different demographic groups moving here and there. Also, some states that are high tax, uh, states that, you know, like sure. New York, where I live, or California, where I live, uh, people are moving to better climates. People are moving where it's cheaper to live. Absolutely. And we're seeing this happen in large numbers now of individuals moving out of California. A lot of people, a lot of Californians are upset sure. about various economic measures, uh, taxes that they are facing that they don't want to deal with. So they're moving to Texas, they're moving you know, into the Midwest and other states. Uh, and it's something that does have a huge impact on elections that a lot of people aren't happy about. But we're going to be heading now to a story for the U.S. Census uh, and uh, giving you some more information on that. So let's take a look at that. Why do only 49% of surveyed adults feel that they are accurately represented in the U.S. Census? The U.S. Census, conducted every 10 years, gives insight to our country's diversity and how it continues to change. Census data for Connecticut shows that since 2010, the Hispanic and Latino population has increased while the white population has decreased, a trend that is seen in the overall U.S. population as well. However, there's reason to believe that data on the Hispanic and Latino population may be skewed. Compared to 2010, more people left the race and Hispanic origin question unanswered in 2020. Without this information, the Census Bureau must rely on government records, interviews, and even educated guesses to identify the individual's race and origin. In order to record more accurate data on individuals' Hispanic and Latino origins, changes were to be made to the 2020 Census to reframe the question. However, the White House's Office of Management and Budget never publicly approved the proposed changes, and they were never made to the Census. Framed nearly the same as the 2010 census, the questionnaire asks if an individual is of Spanish, Latino, or Hispanic descent, and then asks their race. Many people of the Latin population do not believe they fit in any of those categories, nor do they consider themselves white. 
According to the PEW Research Center, approximately 49% of surveyed adults feel that the census accurately represents their origin and race. From the census data, statistics are made about different ethnic groups and races, which are then used by various programs to allocate funds and services to specific groups. The data is also used in research behind civil rights policies. The undercounting of Hispanic and Latino individuals creates inaccurate data and therefore a lack of necessary resources for those groups. Of the 435 seats in the House of Representatives, the census determines where they are distributed every 10 years, a process called apportionment. Several right-leaning states like Texas and Florida gained seats while left-leaning states such as New York lost a seat. While Democrats still hold a slim majority in the House, Republicans may gain control in 2022 after voting district lines have been redrawn. Redistricting data has been released from the census and will be used to draw new voting district maps. Redistricting is controlled by state legislatures in which Republicans have the power to draw the lines for 181 seats and Democrats are only able to redraw 49. As we can see, representation matters for a number of reasons in the case of the U.S. Census. Ultimately, census data has vast downstream political effects, and as the population continues to diversify, the census will likely adapt to more accurately represent the people of our country. This is Sophie Beluzzi for WCSU News Election Connection. Now, one of the issues that is also coming to the forefront of American politics again is, as we mentioned previously, growing extremism in the United States. Since the 2016 presidential election, American politics have become increasingly polarized. More extremist policies on both the right and left are becoming increasingly accepted, and the best exemplified symptom of this issue occurred last year on January 6th at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And what we can do as Americans to make sure that the voices of voters are heard and prevent further extremist growth is, is really the question that should be asked here. How can we prevent events like this from happening again while making sure that we recognize the voices and needs of different demographics? We don't hear each other, do we? Right. Right? Nobody, nobody heard the voices of those extremists on January 6th. We saw the anger. We saw the violence. Um, and so everyone else was pitted against them, rightfully so. But on the other side, they were against the rest of us. And so you've got people on two sides. Why? because we're not unified as a country anymore. And look at all the strata of a lack of uh, unification that we have. Absolutely. And it's worth noting that one of the variables that really, really factored into this, uh, and, and still does factor into this increasing polarization in American politics, is trust in the media. Right. So the, the fake news media, uh, that was a phrase coined by former President Donald Trump, uh, and that created a lot of distrust in the media. And we've seen a, a unique, almost bubble form in American politics since the 2016 election that seems like it's getting ready to pop. Well, look, it was even before the 2016 election. Trump just added fuel to that fire. Right. I mean, with the, ex uh, the inception of Fox News, which became such a money-making media outlet, uh, you know, it was amazing. And then he used it to gain his power. And all of his followers went right with it. I mean, we can talk about media later. But, uh, yeah, that's one element. And there's a lot to talk about the Absolutely. subject. Indeed. Which is why we're going to be going now to a quick interview with Dr. Barrett, a professor here at Western Connecticut State University, who I actually had the pleasure of speaking to. So let's take a look. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Barrett, we're really, really excited to have you here for a conversation what? on political extremism. It's certainly a, a hot topic currently, and uh, we want to talk about it and spread some information to our viewers about it. So first and foremost, could you define for me what exactly political extremism looks like in modern America? Sure. So thanks for the opportunity to chat with you today. 
Um, so you can look at, think about it as a bell curve. So you have a bell curve of political beliefs, and in the center are those that most people believe, whether they're left or to the right, doesn't matter. But then as you go out to the ends of the bell curve, you find folks who have these beliefs that the mainstream would reject. They tend to um, be, so they're, they're very extreme, obviously, that's, a, that's redundant, but they're also so far out that they tend to lead, bleed into uh, things like violence and much more extremist behavior like that, like terrorism or things like that. So it's really, uh, again, outside the, outside the regular bell curve is where you find these extremist beliefs. On both sides, again, both the right and on the left. As we're all aware, right, the events of January 6th uh, that happened at the Capitol last year uh, probably had a monumentous impact on the American people, and they certainly did uh, in relation to policies moving forward for quite some time. But what effect do you think the January 6th insurrection will have on the American electorate and how Americans view democracy moving forward? So that's a, that's a pretty big question, obviously. And it's a, it's a product of extremism itself. So it's a, sure. it's a manifestation of what's already been happening for the past you know, five or six years and maybe more. And... Uh, for a lot of people, it was a horrible, horrible event. They looked at this thing; they were shocked that someone was actually attacking the, uh, you know, the U.S. Capitol. Right. Um, but for many Americans, they actually saw this as a vindication of their own personal beliefs. That is, that this government, this the U.S. government, tradition, authority, have been uh, kind of shackling the United States for so long. These folks want to overcome that and over, uh, to overthrow the government and institute a new regime. Um, so, so moving forward, though, because this thing hasn't gone away yet, so even though Congress is now pursuing January 6th, trying to understand how it happened, why right. it happened, there's a lot of pushback against that. And if anything, January 6th is becoming more and more popular rather than less popular, and you would have thought the opposite would have happened. So what we're seeing now is that we're moving more extremism in the support of January 6th, in the support of former President Trump, and so forth. And uh, I think it's going to lead to further splintering of our electorate and, and most likely more violence. That violence has, for the most part, not been punished uh, appropriately, and so it's going to lead to more violence in the future. In terms of how um, the events of January 6th will affect elections moving forward, do you think Americans will vote differently? Do you think elections will be handled differently? I think it allows you to denigrate the, the process. And the reason is that we've seen, especially in Republican-led states, Laws have changed now to allow legislatures to overturn certified votes in those states. So going forward, we're actually going to see probably more overturning of votes, inappropriately so, maybe illegally so. Um, and so we'll see a, a denigration, a deterioration of our democratic process and less and less faith in the process itself, which is a very serious concern. The question is, where does this come from? And there are many, many factors that influence this development, this polarization in the United States. Um, one of the big ones was when Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House and uh, decided his priority would be obstructionistic toward the Clinton presidency, the Democratic uh, uh, presidency. And that actually led to policy changes in the Republican Party that decreased socialization between the parties, decreased them talking to each other, and became, set them up to be enemies of each other. So going from that kind of forward, the political elites ended up kind of pushing this polarization from the top down. At the same time, I realize this is a long answer, but at the same time, we saw this new sorting of identities across the country. And so whereas in the past, Democrats and Republicans would socialize together, they would go play soccer or softball, they'd eat, eat dinner. There, there are other identities in terms of religion, race, preferences for food, even what department stores they go to, used to be overlapping and not distinct. And now what we've seen is this sorting of identities where we have a stack sort here for one party and another stack sort over here. There's less and less interaction between the parties. That's happening from the bottom up as well. So we're seeing the top down process and the bottom up process, which has led to this uh, amazing dehumanization of the other party now, where we stop seeing them as being as human beings. Sure. And once we stop doing that, then we can say things to them we wouldn't normally say to people. Yeah. We can act differently toward them, we can act violently, we can threaten them, yeah. and so on and so forth. So how does all of this rising extremism and, and the widening of the gap between the two major political parties, how does that affect civic life for the average American? Uh, that's another good question. Um, let me just give you an example of how this works, how this can work. If you look at the local school board elections, so local school boards across the country in rural towns like mine, Reading, Connecticut, sure. you have found now these local school boards have become, have become politicized. Yeah. It used to be these were about 
positions, people would vote for who they wanted based upon what they wanted to do with the schools. Now it's based upon party affiliation. And so you've seen civic life, even at a super local level, become much more uh, vitriolic and threatening. And you find national organizations now funding small uh, candidates for small races, but yet bring in this national uh, vitriol, this, these national, uh, this national rhetoric, et cetera. And so it's making civic life much more uh, much less pleasant, much more dangerous, and much more risky. Where people are worried about their kids being beat up in school because of how they how they stand on a in a party. Where, in your eyes, are we headed as a country? So I'm not optimistic about this. I think we're going to see it go worse right before it gets better. We're going to see more violence happening. We're going to see more of this extremist happening until, quite frankly, the Republican Party starts to change its policies. Um, but what we really need now are leaders on both parties who are going to stand up and say, enough of this, let's change the rhetoric, let's challenge the rhetoric, and start moving forward and agreeing to solve problems. You know, in the past, at least the parties could say, yes, we agree on the problems. Now they can't even do that, let alone agree on the solutions. And so until we have folks who can stand up and start doing that, I'm, I'm worried we're going to see more and more violence, more of this uh, negativity and um, deterioration again in democratic norms and in democracy itself. Um, but what we really need now are leaders on both parties who are going to stand up and say, enough of this, let's change the rhetoric, let's challenge the rhetoric, and start moving forward and agreeing to solve problems. Well, thank you again, Dr. Barrett. I thank you for having me. You know, Dr. Barrett is spot on with this. We've got to change. We've got to change. I mean, I remember those days when Republicans and Democrats played softball together, for God's sake. And you look at it now, I worry about the future of you, of my college students. This is not a really healthy environment for them to come into their own in their lives during. But one thing that I'm sure of for living as long as I have is that things change. But right now, everything's polarized. Absolutely. Right? There are topics that should not be polarized, like, like climate change. Sure. Right? Yeah. We all benefit from assaulting this problem. You'd think that of the issues that we face, uh, that would be one of the easiest to come together on. For sure. Um, but uh, speaking of climate change, we actually have another WestCon professor, um, Dr. Wagner. He's going to call in on the phone, and I'm going to ask him some questions, go over some things about climate change, um, and have a little discussion about that. So on the phone, Dr. Wagner, let's, uh, let's go to him. Thank you for inviting me. Of Please course, Dr. Here. Wagner. Great to have you on. Um, just a few questions here for you tonight. Uh, the first of which is, do you think that climate change is an issue that is on voters' minds currently? Well, it is in some people, those people particularly who have suffered from it directly in the last uh, little bit of time, if they're willing to look at it in, that, in, that, in those terms. Um, you know, uh, the people in, in other parts of the country where it seems more distant or have their own have other concerns. Right. Makes sense. So what is currently being debated in Congress regarding climate change and President Biden's agenda? Well, up until just last week, <clears throat> the big question whether what had to do with the uh, uh, clean electricity, uh, clean electricity um, uh, proposals. Uh, but that's been dropped from the potential bills that are being discussed. Uh, what we have right now is one individual who is determined to change things in his own way, and because of the uh, thinness of the margin of the Democrats in the Senate, uh, he's able to get by with it. And he just happens to be someone who, you know, has roots in the uh, coal business. <clears throat> right, right. Okay. So... Outside of legislation that we are currently looking at, um, what's already been passed? What's being done right now to help fight climate change? Well, there have been um, a big increase in the amount of um, solar and wind installed because actually it's becoming cheaper um, than fossil fuels. Um, of course, right now the big thing is a big international agreement uh, called COP26 that's taking place in um, – in, in Scotland, um, and there is a big uh, 
a big report that just re was released by the Red Cross on the uh, problem of climate refugees. Uh, turns out that in 2020, uh, there were 30.7 million displaced people displaced by disasters, 98% of which were climate related. This is, this is going to be a great big deal. So on top of what Dan Barrett was talking about just a few minutes ago, of the polarization of the American public, you're going to have a whole bunch of desperate people trying to get in. Right. Sure. No, yeah, makes, makes sense, absolutely. And final question here for you, Dr. Wagner. Um, mm -hmm. Climate change is the existential question really facing humanity today. Now, yes. do you think that we are too late? Well, we're too, too late to, to stop it in its tracks. Um, but we always have hope. We are, can never be hopeless until we have decided to give up hope. We're actually pretty clever organisms, and we figured out ways around these things. But we're going to have to um, have an attitude adjustment. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the uh, for the input there. I really do appreciate it, Dr. Wagner, and uh, we'd love to have you back again. Happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Well, as we just heard there, uh, climate change uh, is, is a very, very important issue nationwide, worldwide, and to the ind individual American voter. Um, it's something that we need to pay more attention to, and it even factors into the infrastructure bill that we were talking about previously. You know, uh, it's, it's one of those issues that is multifaceted, we can't get away from, and that we certainly have to deal with. It's something well, that sure. I mean, I'm not quite sure what the date is, but quite shortly, climate change will not be able to be reversed. Right. You, right? Yeah. And then... Frankly, there goes humanity. Yeah, and that's, that's definitely concerning. Uh, and <laughs> it's also a, a, a global initiative, right? That's, that's what it's going to take. Because contrary to popular belief, the United States of America is not the only uh, mass producer of, of carbon into the atmosphere, right? Well, we're, yeah. we're, we're not number one in the world. China is number one in the world. And then after that, you have India, right? Yeah. These are countries with massive populations, billions and billions of people, right? And um, especially in India and other uh, uh, countries of a slightly lower, you know, socioeconomic status that don't have access to certain renewable energy, because that's, that's the thing, really. Renewable energy sources, whether it be wind or solar, those aren't things that attract poor countries, right? Um, they're not things that attract countries in Africa, that attract India. China could do it, but they don't want to because it's going to affect their bottom line. It's going to affect their production, and it's not something that they care about. So what we need to do is do a better job of getting the entire world on the same side because you can't just have the United States and Europe trying to fight climate change. Not at all, but I mean, right now, they are in Glasgow, all the world leaders trying to solve this problem. Sure. And you know who needs to fight? It's not me. It's you, Jake, and your contemporaries. Little Greta Thunberg is there right now calling on her, her, the adult population and saying, you guys screwed it up for us. I heard that from my own niece and nephew. They were angry. They said, your generation screwed it up. So it's about time that this younger generation goes with it and says, look, we're not going to have a future. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to be going now to an update from our field reporter, Kathleen Dowling. She's in the field covering the Stanford race. So we're going to be getting some information from her on what the numbers are looking like out there. So let's go to the field. Hello, this is Kathleen Dowling reporting again from the Palace Theater located right next to the Democratic headquarters in Danbury. So a quick overview of the election in Stamford. Caroline Simmons, the Democratic candidate, has a history in state office and has been a member of the House of Representatives since 2015. A Harvard graduate, she is currently the youngest women, woman senator in Connecticut state office. She also worked for Obama's presidential transition team and the Department of Homeland Security. And this is her first time running for local office. Um, which she shares with um, unaffiliated candidate Bobby Valentine. So this is Bobby Valentine's first time running for local office as well. And locals and sports fans may know him from his career as a prolific baseball player and manager for teams as famous as the Boston Red Sox and the New York Mets. 
He currently serves as the athletic director for Sacred Heart University in Fairfield and is a successful business owner running both Bobby Valentine Sports Academy and Bobby Valentine Sports Gallery Cafe in Stanford, among other local ventures. And this is his first time running for politics. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, Kat. Appreciate all the information there. Um, now, someone who does not live in Stanford might be confused about the candidates and their different party affiliations. Could you shed some light on the endorsements of the candidates in this race? Yes, of course, Jacob. Um, Caroline Simmons is endorsed by both the Democratic Party as well as the Independent Party, and she beat out incumbent mayor David Martin for the Democratic endorsement. So Bobby Valentine, who is running as unaffiliated and received endorsement from the Republican endorsed candidate Joe Corsello after Valentine was endorsed by the Stanford Police Association. Right. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. That really does help uh, and uh, certainly useful information for those who might be voting tonight. But thank you so much, Kat. Really do appreciate all the information. And uh, we're, of course, going to be coming back to you throughout the night for more All right. Updates. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you. All righty. Well, as we just heard there, um, we have some interesting party affiliations between our two candidates down in Stamford. Very, very interesting when you have major parties endorsing candidates who are technically independent and vice versa. Yeah. But more importantly, Bobby Valentine. <laughs> Go Mets. Absolutely. Yes. We have a uh, we have a, a former Major League Baseball player. Baseball player. He's an yeah. icon. Yeah. 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 And, and a great guy, too. Absolutely. So what we'd like to do now is toss this over to Jennifer at the board. Thank you, Dr. Guzda. For now, let's take a look at some of the special elections that occurred in Connecticut during 2021. For Connecticut State Senate, District 27 was called for an election on March 2nd when Carla Leon resigned in January 5th. Democrat Patricia Miller defeated Republican Joshua Essies and Brian Merlin of Independent Party with over, with almost 4,700 votes. As for District 36, a special general election was called for on August 17 of 2021 when Democrat Alex Kaser resigned on June 22 due to her divorce proceedings. Uh, Republican Ryan Fazio defeated both Democratic Alexis Steventer and Independent John Blankley with over 8,900 votes. As we can see, the votes were pretty close for Fazio and Steventer, but he did take the win in this. Uh, these are so far the only special elections that occurred in Connecticut in 2021 so far. Whether there will be more, we will have to wait and see. That is all from my part for now. Back to you guys at the desk. Well, thanks so much, Jennifer. Appreciate all the updates. I'm looking forward to more information coming up. Now, next up, we are going to talk about trust in the media in the American public. Um, it's, it's something that has waxed and waned throughout American history, but right now it's actually reaching a historic low. Not the lowest it's ever been, but it is certainly close to it. Um, and it's something that factors into elections. We saw that in 2020, quite a few American voters uh, were not happy with the election system that year, in part by media outlets telling them that um, their votes weren't secure, which is a reasonable thing to be upset about. But again, that is because they were being uh, uh, told that from specific outlets. Um, and uh, I mean, these, these media outlets have a tremendous impact on our democracy and on, on our elections and, and how... Uh, People perceive various issues, and um, well, it's it's something that well, I, I don't know, Professor Gizda. What do you think when people have um, such a, a distrust in the media? What well, does that say? What that says is that we have to look at the history of how this happened. I mean, we were just talking about Facebook, and Facebook yeah. just it rolls on. They tell a friend, they tell two friends, they tell four friends, and all of a sudden, people look at social media. And what they think, which is erroneous, but they feel it strongly, is supported, and they believe it. Uh, we're looking, we're talking about media outlets. 1996, Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act, which allowed, in any given media market, someone to own as many radio or TV stations as they could afford. So now, when you drive home tonight and you just turn on AM radio, 
you will hear voice after voice of right wing something I, in my professional view, think of as hate speech. Um, you know, we're talking about all kinds of things. I mean, this, this trust in anything printed now has gone now. Although, although it's ironic that when people judge media outlets and how much they trust it, they're, asking, they're asking for fairness. They're asking for balance. They're asking for all the things that they should. Right. And they're not getting. Sure. Yeah. And this is something that the American public is rather split on. It's worth noting. According to a Gallup poll from October 7th, actually, very recently, 68% of Democrats, 31% of independents, and only 11% of Republicans trust in the media. So we're seeing this as a, a large split, large divide between the parties. You have 68% of Democrats trust in the media, 11% of Republicans not trust in right. the media. And it's, it is worth noting that Democrats and independents, their trust has actually still gone down since last year. By yeah. five percentage points, Republicans have stayed around 10% for the last couple of years. 10% of Republicans uh, trust in the media. I mean, that's an that's a, that's a incredibly low statistic, right? Uh, and it's, it's something that uh, is honestly unprecedented, right? That's if you assume that America is split almost half and half, right? You're essentially purporting there that that's about what? What is that? Maybe 20% maybe of the American population, 30% of the American population that refuses to trust the media? You know, it's, it's something that uh, is concerning. But as far as the, the hate speech uh, point that you made, Dr. Gizda, um, we know in, in regards to media and, and the radio and things like that, could you expand upon that a little bit? Oh, my God. I mean, anybody can see that. Uh, there's so much right-wing talk. Al Gore tried to start something called Air America, which was a left-wing radio outlet. But it wasn't popular with the left-wingers, and so that died. So you have no voice on the left side in radio. There's a few, but not enough to counter what's going on in the right. And then in television, of course, you've got Fox News, you've got OAN, uh, who are just dominating with right-wing talk. But on the progressive side, we have got MSNBC. We've got Rachel Maddow and all of those voices. Uh, but they're not as well watched as the right. Why? Because pushing their agenda and people who watch this think, yeah, that's how I feel, that's how I see it. Sure. And so they get more numbers. Now, the right. interesting thing, though, is that uh, Fox News made so much money that that's how MSNBC was born. Right. It was yeah. the same business model, and they wanted, once again, the money. All right. Well, we do have actually uh, have some breaking news here. Uh, Glenn Youngkin in the Virginia race is actually ahead. Currently, he holds 54.6% of the vote, while Terry McLaughley only holds 44.7%. Now, it is still too early to call Virginia, um, but this is rather unprecedented. So we definitely want to keep you guys updated on that as we go throughout the night. Um, it's... It, uh, could be could be very very surprising there down at Virginia. Well, that's that's a big stretch. Um, Youngkin, of course, is um, is is a Trump aficionado, although he does not want Trump campaigning with him. And Terry McAuliffe was the ex governor, ex Democratic governor of Virginia. It's a big stretch right now, ten percent. But when the cities start coming in, I predict that McAuliffe's um, polls will rise. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Gizda. And uh, just to remind everyone, you are watching WCSU's Election Connection. This is Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage for 2021. I'm Jacob Schultz. This is Dr. Gizda, who has joined us tonight very kindly. And you can find us on YouTube at WCSU Election Connection and at wcsu.edu slash live. You can also listen to us at WXCI-91.7FM and tweet us at ElectionCT.
joining us. It's a very, very contentious issue, and it is one of these things that uh, we need to keep an eye on in America, right? Um, the media needs to be trusted. It needs to be something that Americans can trust to give them valid and legitimate information. And what do you think the reason is, Dr. Gisto, that you have such a large demographic of, of Americans? We were just talking about only 10% of our Republicans. Why do so few of them trust the media? Well, as we were saying, that opinion is being voiced over and over again, mistaken for fact many times, presented in major news outlets as fact when it's not. With the onset of President Trump, um, you know, I go to the Washington Post fact check checker almost every day to see who lied today and, you know, the strength of their lies. He was always up there when he was president. Um, and so here we are in these two polarized groups almost to the fact that, you know, extremists are walking amongst us. Right. And, and when you say extremists, what, what do you mean? Could you define that a little bit more? Of course. We were talking about it before. Extremists are people who think that they have a right to storm the Capitol on January 6th. Extremists are people um, of all ilk who are not going to meet anybody in the middle, ever. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely see what you mean. Um, and it's something that uh, we need to be aware of, for sure. But uh, we're going to be going now to a story specifically about distrust in the media. So let's check that out. Since February of 2017, the term fake news has been searched 75% more than any previous years. With the birth of the internet in 1983, America's trust in media has been on a steady decline. A graph provided by Gallup shows more than a 10% decrease in media trust by Americans in the past two decades. And the growing reliance on social media for information is only making the matter worse. Local and national news agencies have stricter policies in place to prevent the spread of misinformation and disinformation. Here's former NBC Hartford investigative reporter Sandra Jones talking with us about policy and vetting. There was a policy when I worked at NBC, and even now when I work for television, that we don't put out in this, this information or disinformation. And we, with the job that I had in both in Connecticut and now, everything is vetted. These policies and vetting practices have an important impact on local news outlets. A study by Knight Gallup reveals that the highest percentage of trust is with local news. In Congress, there is bipartisan backing for the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, which, if passed, would provide tax credits to citizens and businesses who support local newspapers and media. This has been C.J. Sosner with Western Connecticut State University Election Connection. Great package there from C.J. Sosna. We're going to be going now to our field reporter, Brendan Castro, who is going to give us an overview of the Handem race. So let's go to the field. Thank you, Jacob. We're out here uh, reporting on the Hamden race. So we have Democrat Lauren Garrett, who's a former member of their town council. She graduated University of Michigan 2002 with a degree in naval architecture and marine engineering. She wishes to solve Hamden's financial difficulties and develop the economy more. Uh, she also wants to improve the school system, which is something that we're seeing a lot of. Um, and she believes that the crime in Hamden is trending down and hopes that economic development will help to further curb the crime rate. Um, we've also got against her Republican Ron Gambardella, who served on Hamden's town council as well. He has a Bachelor of Science in Accounting and Economics. And he's hoping for better budgeting, reduction of crime through community-based policing, and he refuses to raise taxes, allegedly. Gotcha. Well, thanks for all the information there, Brendan. Very much appreciate it. Now, crime rate is a hot-button issue in Hamden. How are candidates proposing to deal with crime? Uh, once again, Garrett is hoping to curb crime by further developing the economy and doing it in a more even way instead of just focusing on one area. And uh, Gambardella simply wants more policing that's community-based. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, Brendan. Really appreciate that. And we're, of course, going to be coming you. back to you throughout the nights for more updates. 
All right. Well, um, as we just saw there, some very, very interesting races down in Hampton. Crime rate is an issue that uh, really does grip the nation, not just specific towns in Connecticut. You know, it is, it is a nationwide thing, especially in cities that a lot of people are concerned about. And a lot of voters will be voting with that in mind. It affects business owners. It affects everyone, really. And it's something that we do need to uh, keep our eyes on for sure. Yeah, I mean... For the longest time, I think it was something like a 20-year stretch, crime was low across the cities of the United States, and nobody knew why. They couldn't pin a reason on it. But with COVID and inflation, we have had such a crime spike all across the United States. But I liked what Brendan was talking about. Um, he said that we need community policing. And I know being a New York City resident that has been in talks for the longest time, and data shows that that works, and also the economy. If people are poor, they're unhappy. Right, absolutely makes sense. Um, and there's certainly, you know, other things that uh, that do factor into crime, but it's really a circle, right? Uh, people, you know, are, are raised in a home where they might not have the support they need. They are at a predisposition to commit crimes and to experience other factors like not graduate from high school or college and, and other things that do influence the chances of, uh, of them committing crime. So it's something that, you know, is a, is a multi-faced issue, and we need to attack it from different angles. Education is a big part of this as well. Sure, of course. I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. Sure. But it's the economy, stupid, to quote Bill Clinton. Right. Right? Uh, people don't have food, they're going to go, go out and get it. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, it's very multifaceted, as you said. Um, but you got to start somewhere with the bigger problems. Sure, makes sense. Well, uh, we're going to be going now to a weather update from our student meteorologist, Eric Alf. We have chilly temperatures for today, and actually those temperatures are going to get downright cold tonight. We could be seeing our first freeze of the season tonight, and that's actually pretty late. We usually see that in October, which is a testament to how warm it actually has been this October. The chill should continue for the rest of the week with highs mostly in the lower 50s for the majority of it. And we do look like to dodge a bullet with a coastal storm that does come rather close to the region, but it looks like it will not be impacting us. I'll get to that in a bit. We do have a few advisories and warnings from the National Weather Service, a few frost advisories and freeze warnings. And Danbury is within the dark purple. That's a freeze warning because temperatures will get rather close to that freezing point tonight. Temperatures right now aren't too bad though with 48 in stores, 52 in Hartford, 47 in Danbury and 49 in New York City. So rather nice as of right now, but those temperatures certainly are going to tank as we go throughout the nighttime hours. So we have a dip in the jet stream. We call this a trough in the eastern portion of the country and off to the west. We have what we call a ridge in the jet stream, which is a rise up to the north. And that's what's keeping war temperatures over there. Now, I would expect those warm temperatures to move eastward and bring us warm temperatures later on in the week, but that's not going to be the case, and I'll explain why. But our infrared satellite picture does show some cloud cover in Danbury, and there's actually some showers south of the region with those associated clouds, but that shouldn't really make it into the Danbury area. I can't rule out a spray sprinkle throughout the night as we go throughout the night. And then taking a, a broader picture, the Great Lakes region is right here and Danbury is right here. We have some clouds associated with our cold air going over the Great Lakes, which is producing those clouds. But then looking further out off to the west, we do see clear conditions just off to the west of the Great Lakes region and south of it. And then looking in the Midwest region, we do have clouds that is in association with a low pressure storm system that will actually be making its way into the Gulf of Mexico and developing a few storms along the East Coast that will travel up, but it looks like they will miss us. And this high pressure off to the West will be the dominant forcing for the rest of the week. But those two, those storm systems that I didn't mention, here's as of Friday, Thursday night into Friday morning, we have high pressure dominating the region at that time. And we have a storm system off to the coast is going to miss the Northeast because of that high pressure. And then as we look forward into Sunday, the, there's a high pressure center just off to the south as that old high pressure moves off to the east. So because the center is further to the south, we can expect this low pressure system to come closer to the region, but it still looks like to be a miss as that high pressure becomes the dominant forcing of that, 
of the weather. And that counterclockwise circulation of the low pressure will bring in northeast winds, which will keep those temperatures down despite that ridge making it to the region. We do have moderate color as of the fall foliage report as of November 1st, so if you do plan on going leaf peeping, be sure to keep that in mind because we will get into peak color soon and we will see those colors begin to go away. As of tonight, though, we will have a temperature of 33 degrees, really close to that freezing point. We may even get to it because of that. We do have that freeze warning from 12 a.m. Wednesday until 8 a.m. Wednesday. And for t Wednesday, we do have high 49 degrees. Struggling to get to that 50 degree mark, it probably won't, but it's certainly possible with winds 5 to 15 miles per hour, a little bit breezy with mostly sunny skies and some a.m. frost could be left over. Wednesday night, low 32 degrees. We might get, we will most definitely get another freeze warning by that time with mostly clear conditions and calm winds. So that will certainly help to keep those temperatures really cold throughout the night. Our extended forecast shows Wednesday 49, Thursday 48, Friday 49. You get the big picture. We're going to struggle to get to 50 degrees for a majority of the work week. Saturday, we could make it to 50 degrees, mostly sunny skies. And then even Sunday is looking dry despite that coastal storm off to the coast. But like I said, it looks like we will dodge a bullet and we will stay dry with a high of 51 degrees. Back to you guys. Well, thank you so much for the updates there, Eric. Really appreciate it. Abortion has entered the main news cycle in America recently. The recent Texas Heartbeat Act has once again brought abortion up as a very contentious issue for American voters. Now, the Biden administration has asked the Supreme Court to overturn this piece of legislation. Let's take a look at our story relating to abortion. So, what is going on in Texas? As of September 1st, Texas officials passed legislation called the Heartbeat Law. This law bans abortion six weeks into pregnancy. The controversial nature of this legislation has sparked much conversation. The first being the effect on minorities. According to abortion providers in Texas, most women receiving abortions are minorities. Thomas Sainz, the president and general counsel of the American Legal Defense and Education Fund said, it's clear that the state is in a demographic transition. It's making people in power feel threatened, and new measures are a negative response to the demographic change. On the contrary, some believe that the law is in response to Texas's growing pro-life population. The Texas Tribune writes, Republican voters in Texas strongly support making abortion illegal after six weeks of pregnancy, a restriction that eliminates an estimated 85% of all abortions in the state. So what is significant about six weeks? Many pro-life activists believe that at six weeks, the baby's first heartbeat is formed. They feel any abortion after that point is considered murder. Republican Texas Senator Brian Hughes says the heartbeat is the universal sign of life. If a Texan's heartbeat is detected, his or her life will be protected. Medical professionals have also expressed concerns, some being that at six weeks, most women don't even recognize that they are pregnant and that the heartbeat is just electrical impulses going through the patient's body as the baby's heart is not fully formed yet. Dr. Verma says every patient sitting in front of us is different, which is part of why these one-size-fits-all laws can be really harmful. Another topic of discussion that has been floating around is the way in which the law is written. The law is written in a way that takes the enforcement out of the court's hands and into the hands of ordinary citizens. Texas civilians now can sue anyone receiving an abortion or aiding in receiving an abortion. This includes Uber drivers, medical practices, and even the friend that accompanied you. The civil suit sues for a minimum of $10,000. The law also doesn't make any exceptions for rape or incest victims, only for those whose pregnancy may endanger their lives. Pro-life activists have responded to this by creating whistleblower websites aimed to help expose people that are trying to receive abortions. Pro-choice activists have responded by clogging up the whistleblower websites. Some companies, such as Uber, have offered to cover legal fees of drivers being sued. So how is this going to affect the entire country, even down to the local level, such as Danbury? The writing of this law opens a Pandora's box for other lawmakers to follow suit. This will trigger an increased need for people to be active voters and pay attention to politicians to make sure that their beliefs are advocated for on both sides. 
Another effect is on the economic level. Caitlin Myers, a professor of economics at Middlebury College, talks about how abortions have allowed women to finish their educations and become a substantial part of the workforce. If this law gets passed in other states, it would also affect the country's economy. Women make up 47% of the workforce. If an increasing number of women are taken out of the workforce to care for their children, it is believed that we could experience a labor shortage. It is expected that over the next couple months, we will continue to see more development on this story. This is Kathleen Dowling for WCSU News, Election Connection. So, yeah, abortion is a, is a massive issue, and it, it has been since and before the passing of what we all know, Roe v. Wade, right, which legalized abortion um, in the United States. It was the Supreme Court ruling to do so. And we're, it's still a very divided issue for Americans. According to Pew Research, 39% of the U.S. believes that abortion should be illegal in all or most cases. 59% believes it should be legal in all or most cases, and 2% wasn't sure. This is a very contentious issue, right? We have Americans grappling between groups seeking to preserve a woman's right to choose and those seeking to protect the lives of the unborn. Well, all said and done, but I would assume that if abortion was taken away out of the United States, I would not feel as if I was a citizen of the United States anymore. If someone would place a law over my own choice, over my own body, I would want to leave this country. Now, it's a really strange law that Texas has created, uh, that private citizens actually can turn in someone who helped facilitate an abortion. And actually, six weeks, you don't know if you're pregnant at six weeks. You could just have heartburn. Right. Yeah. So, but you're talking about Americans, Jacob, Americans this, Americans that. But not all Americans can carry a child. Sure. Right? And so this is a personal privacy issue. And I know that the argument against that is, well, it's a Texan with a heartbeat. But it is not viable on its own. And if you are going to make a law to protect something like this, we have to protect all across the board, like Fertilized eggs, right? What do they do with fertilized, fertilized eggs in fertility clinics? They throw them in the garbage when they're right. not needed anymore. So this, this anti-abortion stance does not make any sense unless we make it make sense across the board. Right. Now, one thing that, that is worth noting is that, um, like you said, this law has a lot of uh, a very specific and honestly, um, really kind of unprecedented uh, parts to it, right? It's odd. Yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely unique in a sense. Um, but if the state of Texas chooses to outlaw abortion, um, you know, within their state lines uh, at six weeks and, and onwards, right, um, is it the federal government's responsibility to intervene and overturn that? Because that's what the Biden administration is asking uh, Texas to do. I'm, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court to right. do. Right, and, they, and they, the Supreme Court was not very kind to the state of, uh, the state of Texas today. Right. Uh, you had Kavanaugh and you had Amy Coney Barrett, who they thought would, si would side with the other side. But they said, wait a minute, if you can apply these parameters to abortion, could you not apply it also to the First Amendment rights? Could you not apply it to, hello, Texas, the Second Amendment rights? Right. And so they threw it back to Texas. I think that the watershed uh, legal test is going to come next month with the state of Mississippi, who are actually going to confront head on Roe versus Wade. That is true. Yes, Daniel, uh, December 2nd, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, Mississippi is going to the United States Supreme Court. It'll be really interesting um, to see how that case ends up. This is a constitutional issue, right? That's, that's what this is about. It is a matter of how the Constitution is interpreted, and that's why it should go to the Supreme Court, right? Because we have a couple different things at play here. Is it the state's responsibility to regulate this issue? The Tenth Amendment states that all powers that are not enumerated for the federal government, meaning specifically outlined for the federal government uh, in the U.S. Constitution, uh, that those powers should fall to specific states. And they should be able to make their own decisions, right? So we have a, a, 
uh, interesting dynamic here, right? Well, look, we can talk legislation for all we want. And legislation has allowed women to have freedom over their own bodies since the 1970s. But it's not going to stop abortion. The wire hanger abortions, the backroom abortions, those have been going on forever and ever and ever. And it's just going to keep happening. Right. Um, well, we're going to be going now to uh, an update relating to COVID-19 in Danbury, Connecticut. So as of October 20th, 2021, of the 20,000 community college students that are currently enrolled on campus, um, they're on-campus learners this fall, 16,000, um, or basically 80%, are fully or partially vaccinated. 74% of exclusively online learners are partially or fully vaccinated as well. And, and this really bears the question is, at what point is our vaccination percentage high enough, right? At what point does it get to uh, a place where we can uh, stop pushing or requiring students to do it? Because if I'm being honest, if they haven't gotten at this point, what, what are the chances of, of students getting it, right, you know? Well, they might have little brothers and sisters, and those are the ones that can still be affected. That's why, I mean, we have really good vaccination numbers at WestCon, and people in general have been wearing their masks when they should. But I have been asked in class by students, can we take off our masks? And I'm like, well, you know, you got little brothers and sisters at home. Because sure. I have had all my shots, like my dog, and I can still so I can still transmit that Delta variant to someone without my knowing. So right. that's who I'm worried about, the unvaccinated. Well, we actually have some breaking news here. Uh, Democratic nominee Eric Adams has just been elected mayor of New York City. No surprise. And uh, a quick update for the Virginia governor race that we were speaking about before. Um, we've actually uh, seen the gap widen between Youngkin and McAuliffe, 54% uh, for Youngkin and 44% for McAuliffe. Um, so we're gonna keep you guys updated on those races as we go here throughout the night. Um, we'll be going now to a story about COVID-19 and giving you some updated information on that. Let's take a look. In March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic shut down the world. Now in 2021, right at the cusp of normalcy, COVID-19 numbers have spiked as new variants emerge. According to UC Davis Health, as of July 22nd, nearly 80% of patients that tested positive for COVID-19 were positive for the Delta variant. UC Davis Health also reported that nationally 97% of those who are hospitalized with COVID-19 are those who are unvaccinated. Vaccination status has been an increasingly polarized issue that's both present online and in real life. The hashtags that are promoting anti-vaccine, anti-mask, and other variations have created an abundance of online debate. In early August, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont and the Acting Health Commissioner, Dr. Gifford, expressed concern over rising COVID-19 numbers, yet they did not reinforce the previous mask mandate. Instead, Governor Lamont declared that municipal leaders had the choice on mask requirements, regardless of vaccination status. Since then, the mask mandate has taken effect in multiple cities, such as New Haven, Hartford, Bridgeport, and Danbury. After reinstating the mask mandate in Danbury on August 15th, 2021, Danbury Mayor Joe Cravo publicly stated that the Delta variant spread in surrounding counties raised his concern. And thus, he asked businesses and residents to remask to protect the community. The CT Insider reports that in early September, COVID-19 cases were low among the CT college and universities. This could be due to the vaccination mandate by the Connecticut State College and Universities, or CSCU. CSCU President Chang announced that the Board of Regents decided that all undergraduate and graduate students are required to be vaccinated with exemptions for medical and non-medical reasons. President Chang noted that according to the CDC, COVID-19 vaccinations are safe and effective at preventing the COVID-19 infection, and they virtually eliminate severe illness and death. This concept of mandatory vaccination is not new. 
According to the Library of Congress, in 1777, George Washington feared the impact that the smallpox virus variola was having on the Continental Army. As a result, he pushed through with mandatory inoculations because he stated necessity not only authorizes, but seems to require the measure. President Chang also noted that students who are not vaccinated are required to be tested on a weekly basis. This is Bianca Pasquone for WCSU News Election Connection. Well, COVID is out there, and as things get colder and colder, it's going to happen more and more. So let's check on the weather tonight and go to Eric. It was a chilly day today, and we can expect temperatures actually tonight to bottom out, possibly around freezing tonight, causing the uh, first freeze of the season possibly. If not tonight, then certainly some other point in this week because the chill does continue at least for the rest of the week. And then we do have a close call of the coastal storm, but it looks like we will dodge a bullet with any storms in the Atlantic as it looks to miss us for the time being. We do have advisories and warning and advisory, advisories by National Weather Service, frost advisory and freeze warning for uh, parts of the Northeast with Danbury within that freeze warning as we will expect temperatures to get close to 32 degrees, that freezing point. Temperatures right now aren't too bad though, 48 in stores, Hartford is 52, Danbury 47, 49 in New York City. So it's not too bad right now, but expect those temperatures to drop quite significantly as we go throughout the nighttime hours. We do have a big drop dip in the jet stream just off in the Great Lakes region and in the northeast. That's what we call a trough. And then off to the west, we have what we call a ridge in the jet stream, which is a rise northward of the jet stream. And that's going to provide warm conditions for the western part of the country. And you would expect those warmer conditions to move off to the east. But there's something that's going to prevent that from happening. I'll show you in a bit. We have a bit of cloud cover in Danbury, and actually just to the south, there's some showers associated with those clouds. But just looking off to the west, we do have some clear skies with still a few clouds around. And if we do zoom out, this is the Great Lakes region. We do have that cold air surging in from the northwest into, on top of the warmer waters, which is forming, causing those clouds to form around that region. And then just looking off to the west and south of that region, we do have some clear skies just south and west of that region. And we do, we, have, we do have clouds in the Midwest region, and that is an association with a low pressure system that is affecting that area with some rain associated with that. And those clear skies in the mid, mid, other part of the Midwest are associated with high pressure. There's some showers and snow showers within the Great Lakes region because of that cold air going across those warmer waters. And we do have high pressure here and some rain just south of the region but it looks like they will miss us, but I can't rule out a spray sprinkle within this early portion of the evening. So here's as of Thursday to Friday, Thursday morning to Friday, excuse me, Thursday night to Friday morning, we have high pressure dominating a lot of the region. And because of that, this low pressure system will stay far off the coast and it's not looking to affect us in any way. However, on Sunday, we do have a high pressure center located in the southeast portion of the country but some of that high pressure will make its way into the region of the northeast. But because the center is further south, this low pressure system has a possibility of getting close to the region, but it looks like we will dodge the bullet. The only thing that will affect us is this rotation air. So while that ridge would have been moving to the wet, to the east, we will still have to deal with those chillier temperatures because of that northeast, northeast flow from that low pressure system. Fall foliage report does show Danbury within moderate color, but soon we will be getting to peak, and by sooner or later, we will get into that past peak part of the colors. So just be aware of that if you do go out leaf peeping. Tonight, 33 degrees, flirting with that freezing market. Because of that, we do have that freeze warning in effect from 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. with a chance of an early sprinkle, but it looks like a low chance, and it will be cold. Tomorrow, we do have high 49 degrees, barely getting to that 50 degree mark with leftover AM frost. It will be chilly, but we will be mostly sunny. So that is good news right there. Then Wednesday night, low of 32 degrees. We will most certainly have freeze warnings in effect by that time with calm winds and mostly clear conditions. So that will certainly help to keep those temperatures down for that night. So Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we will struggle to make it 50 degrees. We will most likely be in the upper 40s with mostly the partly cloudy skies, but Friday being sunny, so that's great news. Saturday is mostly sunny with 
50 degrees, we should get to that 50 degree mark by that day. Sunday, a little bit warm with a high of 51 degrees with partly cloudy skies. So we do look dry. We look to dodge a bullet with that storm, but I'll keep you updated as we go along through the night. Back to you guys. Well, thanks so much, Eric. Really appreciate weather update. And of course, we're going to be coming back to you as we continue on throughout the night here. But first, we're going to be going to our field reporter, CJ Sosna. He's in the field uh, covering the West Haven race. So let's go to the field and check that out. Hi, Jacob. I'm here at uh, Lexington Connection Watch Party. Uh, it, is a, it is a festive time on the Western Connecticut State University West Side. Uh, we have a bunch of food. We have a bunch of people here. Uh, a really great time. You know, as you know, last year we could not have this in person. So it's really exciting to see people out here, uh, you know, uh, cavorting and having a good time. Uh, back to West Haven, uh, we, have, we have incumbent um, Democrat uh, Nancy Rossi. Uh, she is... She is, uh, she, is, she is campaigning with, on the stability that she's brought over her two years in West Haven. Uh, her, the Republican candidate uh, running against her says that uh, stability is not enough. Uh, he's tired of the finger pointing. He's tired of the, um, the politics in general. He wants to see, he wants to see West Haven uh, a better, more prosperous place. Well, thanks so much, CJ. Really, really appreciate that. Um, now, Democratic incumbent Nancy Rossi hired a private auditing firm to investigate expenditures of a COVID relief fund. Could you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yes, Jacob. Uh, this is a very this is a very polarizing uh, situation. It's it's actually impacting uh, the votes right now, as I understand it. Uh, Michael DeMassa was arrested uh, for stealing um, upwards of $600,000 from the CARE Act, the CARES Act, uh, the COVID relief funds. He was accused of uh, going to the casino uh, and spending, spending thousands and thousands of that money uh, that he had stolen. Uh, he um, is currently out on bond, about $200,000 bond, being treated for gambling addiction and uh, other, uh, other substance issues, cannabis and alcohol, I understand. Right. Well, uh, yeah, that sounds like a very, very uh, interesting situation there, CJ. Uh, I do really appreciate uh, you diving into that for us. Uh, so thank you so much, and we'll come back to you a bit later, all right? Thank you, Jacob. All righty. Um, just a, a quick update here uh, for anyone curious about the uh, New Britain race. Um, a source close to the campaign told News 8 that uh, Bobby Sanchez uh, conceded to Aaron Stewart around 9 p.m., so just a little over, over half an hour ago. Um, Sanchez conceded to Stewart, um, so uh, that means that... Uh, we're going to see Aaron Stewart as our, uh, our, our our new winner, our victor. She's amazing. What is she now, 27, 28, maybe? Yeah, something around there. Yeah. Yeah. Impressive uh, at such a young age, for sure. But now we're, we need to uh, lead into a discussion here about uh, school boards and, and parents that are, are concerned and angry about uh, specific things across America. Uh, many parents are upset with a, a increase, an influx we've seen of uh couple different ideas, right? Uh, it's really a multitude of issues, uh, different things happening from uh, transgender bathrooms uh, to critical race theory in the classroom and things like that. And it begs the question, what say should parents have in, in what's taught in the classroom? And it, this has been going on for, for years now, right? But how much of an influence should parents have on what their students are taught? Uh, I'm sorry, what their children are taught as students. And uh, many feel that it's, it's not the school's place to teach moral issues, like some of which I just mentioned, to children. Well, here's the thing, is that studies show that the more involved a parent is, the more successful the student is. And that's a good thing. That's a plus. Right. But we're talking about moral issues. How involved should a parent be? And how much, should parent, how much power should parents have to make the decisions 
uh, what gets taught, what's not taught, who uses the bathroom, etc. Sure. So it's not so much as an either or discussion. Uh, I welcome that parents want to be more involved. As a lifelong educator, I want to see kids become smarter and stronger. Uh, but this is something I think would be more of a local issue where you have these, lo these local um, decisions to be made and let them duke it out there. Right. Absolutely. And uh, definitely seems like a, a better place for it, you know, than on a state or national level. But we are seeing some lawsuits now that could possibly yeah. get there. Parents are mad. Right. Uh, rightfully so. You know, you, you want to know what your kid's being taught in the classroom. At least most parents do. Um, and at, at least be somewhat comfortable with it. And on that note, we're going to check out a story now about uh, this issue. We're going to go to uh, a quick video here for you. So let's check that out. Boards of education are not usually viewed as being controversial or combative as some have been lately. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening? Sure. So there has been this kind of reputation or, or conception that a board of education meeting is usually pretty boring, mm -hmm. that there aren't a lot of people that attend. You know, they're usually kind of begging people to show up so that they have an audience to talk about these issues. But recently, these have just become highly politicized. And they're talking about two main issues that are generating this controversy. So the first is masks and vaccines, you know, of course, to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. And parents feel very passionately about whether their children should be forced to wear masks when they're in class and the possibility that students might be required to be vaccinated in order to be in the classroom. And the other big controversy that's arising right now is um, general terms is about critical race theory. So the content that's being included to t discuss you know, issues of racism throughout America's history. And we've always had this debate. It's, it's nothing new, but it has become increasingly, increasingly controversial and politicized in recent years. So parents, and for the most part, this is parents. Um, there are some students that are being active in this, but what we're seeing most of is parents getting very involved and very defensive or very you know, expressive about the content that they want their children to learn. And behind it all is kind of this belief that our schools are you know, to train our citizens. And there's a fear that by you know, presenting certain content, students are being told to believe certain things. And as an educator, I find that a little offensive, as most educators would, of our goal is to educate, it's not to indoctrinate. So we're hearing a lot of criticism that people want schools to educate and not indoctrinate. And, you know, I would say, well, that's what we do. That mm -hmm. education means talking about things that you might not agree with. It means talking about things that you might find offensive, but that students need to be exposed to ideas that differ from their own so that they can learn how to discuss them. Because in the real world, not everybody is gonna agree with you. Right. So we want students to gain the skills you know, to effectively communicate about those issues. So it has become increasingly controversial. It's really unfortunate because nothing happens at these Board of Ed meetings when this controversy breaks out. We've seen meetings have to be shut down. We've seen people escorted from Board of Education meetings. And we've seen entire Boards of Education resign because they don't want to deal with this controversy anymore. And we need people who are willing to you know, work towards our children's education. We don't want Boards of Education to feel like they're under attack. We don't want teachers to feel like they're under attack. So we do want parents to participate, but we want them to do so in a, an effective way where you know, they're civil and they're willing to discuss these issues without becoming enraged and without turning it into you know, a, a clip that's gonna go viral on YouTube. <laughs> 
So the issues of critical race theory and COVID regulations in the classroom have presented educators and boards of education, schools and parents with a lot of different variables that, that they need to grasp. Um, and it's, it's something that is not going away anytime soon. Um, perhaps we would hope that with some of the COVID regulations, they might diminish over time. But um, the critical race theory is, is not going away anytime soon. It's something that uh, has been debated as part of our education for a long time, and it is coming to the forefront now. And Americans are very, very divided on it. Um, a, a poll from USA Today saw that only 37 percent of white parents are in favor of their schools teaching critical race theory compared to 83 percent of black parents who support their schools teaching of critical race theory. So we're seeing some drastic differences here. And if this situation is not handled properly, um, we risk really alienating one group or the other. And you're also going to see a lot of parents start to pull their kids out of school and put them into different educational uh, environments, you know, if some of these things aren't addressed in the way that they would like. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a hot topic, it's a sensitive issue, but it's one that we need to take seriously and make sure that we find a good balance between both parties. Look, look, we're, we're talking about our entire nation being polarized. One side, I think we're talking about Congress, we're talking about uh, urban, uh, suburban, we're talking about all of these. If you look at history, our American children have been through a lot worse, um, trying to bring black students into the public schools of Alabama. I think the kids will survive. Right. And, and uh, I, it's not so much a question of, at least for these parents, you know, will, will the kids survive? But um, they, they see it as almost an attack on their um, ability as a parent, you sure, know, to, to control what their kids are exposed to. Um, parents, and I think most would feel they have a right to, uh, up to certain ages, really control what, what uh, material their children consume. And I, for one, I think many others are, are fine with certain sensitive topics being presented in the classroom, as long as they are presented in a way that is unbiased, one might say. And that's, that's where most of these concerns come from, right? But uh, we're going to be going now, actually, to uh, some updated race results. Uh, so, Jennifer, let's see the board. Jacob, we have received an update on the New Britain race. As you mentioned earlier, Bobby Sanchez conceded to Aaron Stewart earlier this hour. The latest numbers we received were of Aaron Stewart taking the lead with 3,312 votes, leaving Sanchez behind with 2,212 votes. Um, as it seems, it looks like Aaron Stewart will be the mayor for New Britain for a fifth term. We continue waiting for other updates on the rest of the towns in Connecticut running for mayor. For now, this is all the updates I have. Back to you guys at the desk. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jen. I uh, really appreciate all that and uh, really, really awesome stuff. Um, now, we do have uh, some breaking news here, actually. Lauren Garrett, uh, the Democrat, has won her election over Ron Gombardello, uh, the Republican in Hamden, Connecticut. Um, so uh, exciting updates there. Uh, Lauren received 6,144 votes, while Ron received 5,052. So not a huge discrepancy between the two. Um, rather close, as a lot of these elections will be. Um, but uh, definitely going to keep all of our viewers updated with more information throughout the night and uh, make sure that everyone's up to date on the races. But just to revert back to what we were uh, speaking about a moment ago, you know, classrooms and, and how we should deal with all of the, the different issues that are being presented. Um, COVID-19 is another one, right, with masks and, and vaccinations that a lot of parents aren't happy with. Um, and it, it begs the question, right, what should we, uh, what influence do we need to allow parents to have? Because, um, I mean, making kids wear masks if their parents don't want to wear masks, don't want them to wear masks, you know, is that the school's right? Is that the school's choice that they should be able to, you know, have over students? So what is the issue? Is the issue my rights, my child, or is it a public health issue? Because first you've got to define what the issue is, what category it is in. And that's why we have the two fighting forces against each other. Sure. No one's listening. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Makes a lot of sense. Well, we're going to be going now to our field reporter in Brookfield, who will be giving us uh, some more updated results there. Thank you, Jacob. We are out here talking about the Brookfield race. So we've got three here. Uh, it's actually for first selectmen. So we have uh, Steve Dunn, who's the incumbent first selectman. He hopes the same position and completes some of the projects he started, which include the streetscape project, which aims to revitalize the sidewalks, as well as an extension of the Greenway Trail into parts of New Milford and Danbury. Um, He's also hoping to complete construction of the Candlewood Lake Elementary School, which began construction under his administration. He's being opposed by Republican Tara Carr, who's a U.S. Army veteran. She wants to bring Brookfield back to, quote, our historical Republican roots, unquote. Uh, she also wants to reduce taxes and curb development, claiming that Brookfield is overdeveloped and she is against mandatory vaccinations. Gotcha. Um, and finally, we've, wait, we've also got independent Austin Montero. He's a former Republican. He wants to bring a new voice, new younger voice to the community. Uh, he's a former CrossFit gym owner, and he wants to balance Brookfield's budget and support small businesses. Thanks so much, Brendan. So how do you think uh, these different candidates' positions on vaccinations, how is that going to affect the way that people vote for them? So um, we haven't heard from from Steve Dunn on vaccinations. However, uh, Austin Montero's main platform is, quote, freedom of choice, unquote. Sure. And he's also stated that he wants to uh, repair the divide that has been created by the pandemic and its hot topics. So we can only assume that he's meaning if you want to get vaccinated, you should get vaccinated. Um, and, you know, we also already know that Tara Carr is against mandatory vaccinations. So it's a similar platform to the independent candidate as well. Gotcha. Well, thank you very much, Brendan. I uh, really do appreciate all the information there, and we'll be coming back to you a bit later. All right, well, we're going to be going now to a story on student debt in America and how it's affecting different people and how we ought to deal with it. So let's take a look. In 2021, students are caught in the storm of debt as it reaches its highest point ever. Not everyone has the means to pay for their college education. Many turn to the help of loans. However, the short-term solution quickly turns into a long-term problem. Student debt has reached almost $2 trillion in the United States. That's a scary number to be facing as a nation. Now imagine what the average number looks like for an individual student. We spoke to Associate Director of Financial Aid, Amanda Favelli at Western Connecticut State University, who stated that the median borrowed loan is $24,300 per WCSU student. And as students, parents, professors, and as a nation, we only hope that our officials are working hard at creating a solution. We reached out to the two candidates running for Danbury Mayor. This is what Democrat Roberto Alves had to say. The student debt crisis is a serious issue which spans nationwide. It has affected over 43 million people in this country and they're buried under more than $1 trillion in debt because they sought higher education. Easing the serious financial burden student loans present will have more positive outcomes which would affect more than borrowers. It would provide relief to families who struggle to make ends meet. It would ease the burden on seniors and have lasting positive economic impact. As for Republican Dean Esposito, we were given no response after sending two emails and leaving a message in his voicemail. Back in July of 2021, the U.S. Education Department under the Biden administration canceled nearly $56 million in student loan debt for some 1,800 borrowers. This brought the administration's total to about $1.5 billion erased. This is only a small dent in the pile of student debt that the nation is facing. Whether this will be enough to help students today and in the future remains to be seen. This is Jennifer Fajardo for WCSU News Election Connection. Now, student debt is something that affects a lot of Americans. It's, it's a huge issue, and it's a concerning issue, right? Uh, just under $1.6 trillion is the total of nationwide student debt. 
uh, and the average per person is $36,000 in federal loans. Um, that's that's <laughs> that's a lot of money for a lot of Americans, you know, um, and it's something that multiple politicians have talked about uh, as they you know run for office, especially on the you know left side of the political spectrum. Um, student loan forgiveness is something that is. Uh, seen by many as a possibility. President Biden actually promised at least a portion of that during his campaign trail, which he has yet to follow through on. Uh, but many other uh, uh, politicians promise uh, ways that we can deal with this issue. Um, but it's $1.6 trillion, you know. Uh, right. that, that money's not going to come from nowhere. And um, it's a bit concerning, right? It's monumental, really. Well, it is because people who oppose uh, forgiving that student debt always bring up the fact that these students had choices. They didn't have to spend $125,000 to go to NYU. Uh, they could have done, which I advise my students to do, to go to community college, a cheaper college, for two years and then transfer, if you can, into that top college. And you will get the degree with the name of your top college on it. No one's going to ask about those first two years. And you've, sa you've saved a big chunk of change. The other thing is that there are certain professions that need, uh, like uh, if you're going to become a doctor <clears throat> or a veterinarian or something like that, you need to have the big name school. But there are professions, they don't care where you went to school as long as you have a degree. Right. So my point is that we've got to look at the differences that happened be between before when students had choices and now. Do we forgive them totally or do we say, hey, you got something valuable. It's time for you to pay up. And I don't think 36000 is that big of a debt. That's the price of a really nice car. Right. Yeah. Well, we're going to be taking a quick break from this and going to our field reporter, C.J. Sosna. We're going to be heading to New Milford, getting some information on the race. So let's head to the field. Jacob, this is uh, this is C.J. Sosna here, still at the the Election Connection watch party. Still have still have a great time going on here. New Milford, New Milford is a much more wholesome race than uh, the one that we saw in West Haven. Democratic candidate uh, Ted Hein is uh, he's he's a life t a lifelong uh, resident of New Milford. He wants to see uh, betterment in education. Uh, he's run he's running against uh, incumbent uh, Republican candidate uh, Pete Bass. Pete Bass uh, is running for his third term. Well, thank you, CJ. Now, do you think that uh, Democratic candidate Ted Hines' uh, lifelong background as living in New Milford, uh, do you think that's going to be enough for him to win the election? Or how, what kind of influence is, is that going to have you know, on, uh, on the way voters view our two different candidates here? That's, that's difficult to ascertain. Uh, he is a self-described hometown boy. Uh, you know, is that enough? Uh, his his the, his uh, opponent uh, has two years behind him of uh, infrastructure improvement, improvement to schools. Um, while while the Hine family is uh, a founding family of New Milford, uh, he he doesn't he doesn't have anything thus far to show for it. Uh, he is asking for transparency in budget issues. Um, it remains to be seen, uh, Jacob. Right. Well, thank you so much, CJ. I really do appreciate all the information you've given us. And uh, definitely looking forward to coming back to this wholesome race in New Milford to see uh, what sort of updates we have. All right? Take care. Thank you. And just a reminder for any uh, who are joining us most recently. Uh, you are watching WCSU Election Connection. This is Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage for 2021. I'm Jacob Schultz, and joining me tonight is Dr. Gusta. And uh, you can find us at uh, on, on YouTube at WCSU Election Connection and wcsu.edu slash live. You can also listen to us over the radio at WXCI-91.7 FM and tweet us at ElectionCT. Tonight, 
we'll be giving you updated results for local Connecticut races, as well as covering other issues like infrastructure, living with COVID-19, and more. Right now, we'll be heading to a story on cannabis in Connecticut. Let's take a look. Cannabis in Connecticut is an issue that uh, has become, you know, very, very debated between, you know, multiple different groups. And other states have led the charge on legalizing marijuana usage in multiple different ways. You have some states where it's, you know, recreationally allowed, some states where it's only still medicinally allowed, some states where it's still entirely legal, right? Um, and it's something that is very varied state by state. Connecticut is moving in the direction of having it be legal, um, and it's something that people on both sides uh, are very opinionated about. Um, so we're going to be heading to a quick story here, quick video for you all relating to cannabis in Connecticut. Let's check it out. Hello, I'm Ethan Fisk, WCSU News. There's been a growing debate over the legalization of cannabis in Connecticut. And as of this past July, Connecticut residents were able to legally and recreationally use marijuana for the first time. States such as Colorado and Washington became among the first to legalize weed recreationally back in 2012. In Connecticut, we saw the decriminalization of weed in 2011, followed by the introduction of a medical marijuana program the year after. We asked some locals their thoughts on this new change in legislation. So how do you feel now that weed is legalized? I actually think it'll help de-stress. I think you'll see grades go up. It'll be a moment. It'll be a moment. I don't think anything will change. Everyone knows that a lot of people smoke weed, so legalizing it, I don't know. I think that it's fantastic that it's legal because people are going to smoke it anyway. Why can't we make money off of it? So if we can get it regulated, we know that it's you know, pure weed and not pure something else or mixed with something else. That's a good thing. It's good. Um, I think that it'll be good for the, for the state. I think it'll be good for the country as a whole. We reached out to local smoke shops in the area for comment, but every single one refused, most likely due to the stigma. Now that Connecticut is the 19th state to legalize recreational marijuana, it's important to understand some key details of the legislation. Adults 21 and older are allowed to possess up to 1.5 ounces of cannabis plant material or up to 5 ounces in a locked container in the home or a locked glove compartment of a vehicle. The state plans to build upon the pre-existing medical program to regulate this new recreational system to ensure that products don't get mistaken and end up in the wrong hands. This should help protect children as well as let the consumer know exactly what's in the product they're buying. Most likely it will take around a year for this new industry to be up and running in the state. Applications for businesses to start selling these new products will be available in the coming months. But for future updates, you can go to portal.ct.gov. I'm Ethan Fisk, WCSU News, Election Connection. Marijuana's been demonized way before even I was in college. And I think we've seen over the years that it's really not that bad for your health. Uh, and you're talking to somebody who stopped at the wine shop on my way over to do this tonight. So you know how, Jacob, this happened? Is that in 1927, a film came out called Reefer Madness. And it showed all of these horrific things that could happen to you if you smoke the reefer. It was things like you'll become a ghoul, you will, will turn around and eat children, and all of that. And if anybody's interested, I have a VHS copy on the shelf in my office, and you, you are free to borrow it. But that's what happened. It created, like what is happening now in politics, in our society, it created a climate of fear. And this has lasted since 1927, something that has been proven not to be as dangerous or harmful as it has been talked up to be. So I think this is a great lesson to be learned. It is now that only now that marijuana is going to be approved for and has been approved for recreational use. So I think we should look at these little things in history that show us how this happened and use it as a lesson. Absolutely. Well, we're going to be heading now to our top of the hour.
This is Election Connection, Western Connecticut State University's live news and election coverage for 2021. I'm Jacob Schultz. We're streaming live over YouTube, WCSU Election Connection, and WCSU.edu forward slash live. You can also hear our live coverage over at WXCI-91.7 FM and tweet us at ElectionCT. Joining me tonight is Professor Jackie Gusta. Well, thanks, Jake. But you know what? I really want to know what the weather's going to be like <laughs> when I drive home tonight. So let's hear from Eric. It was quite a chilly day today. And actually tonight, we could possibly see our first freeze of the season. And if not, we will certainly see that chance across the latter part of the week as that chill does seem to continue as we go throughout the week. And we could see a close call dodging a bullet of a coastal storm that could come near the area, but it looks like it won't be affecting us with any rain, and I'll get to that in a bit. But we do have freeze, a freeze warning for Danbury and frost advisories for other parts of the state, and that is because we do expect temperatures to get to or around that 32 degree freezing point. Temperatures right now aren't too bad though. We have 47 in stores, 52 in Hartford, 48 in Danbury, 48 in New York City. So it is not too bad right now, but certainly expect those temperatures to plummet as we go throughout the night. We do have warm air off to the west and we do have that chilly air locked in place in the Northeast and the Great Lakes region. And that's gonna stick with us for, um, for pretty much the rest of the weekend, we will expect temperatures to struggle to even get to 50 or just stay in the lower 50s for daytime highs with lows in the 30s. We are starting to see some of that cloud cover break through in Danbury, and we can expect that to be the trend for the rest of the night, and we will expect partly cloudy skies as we go throughout the night. And taking a broader look, we do see those clouds forming off of the Great Lakes region as that cold air does surge over the warmer waters forming those clouds. And just looking up to the west, we do have some clear skies ahead and that is thanks to high pressure within the region. But we're gonna zoom out and take a look off to the west and we do have massive clouds within the Midwest region and that is in association with a low pressure system. And with that system, it's producing some rain in that region and that rain is actually gonna move into the Gulf of Mexico and strengthen and form a couple of storms that will go across the eastern part of the coast, but like I said, I don't expect them to have any impact on the area whatsoever, and I'll show you in a bit. So here's the low pressure system. This is after Thursday night into Friday morning, and we have strong high pressure locked within the region, and because of that, that's gonna prevent this low pressure system from getting close to our region. Now on Sunday, there is another storm system that does get relatively close to the region, and that is because the high, other high pressure center is located just to the south portion of the country and because that center is in the southern portion it will allow for that system to get closer to the region but i think the high pressure will win in this case and we will not see any rain associated with that system the latest fall foliage report does show danbury within moderate color so be aware of that we will soon get into peak color and then sooner or later we won't have any color to enjoy so please be aware of that if you want to go leaf peeping Tonight we'll have a low of 33 degrees flirting around with that freezing point and because of that we do have a freeze warning in effect until 12 a.m. tonight till 8 a.m. in the morning. So please be aware of that if you do have any plants that you want to protect, bring them inside if you can. High 49 tomorrow on Wednesday, struggling to get to that 50 degree mark, but luckily we will remain mostly sunny and we will have leftover frost from the night go into the morning hours. And during Wednesday night, it's going to be cold again. We're possibly, possibly going to get to a 32 degree point, and we will most definitely see some freeze warnings during that night issued. And we'll be mostly clear and calm winds, so that would definitely help those temperatures to get rather cold throughout the night. Our extended forecast show Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday struggling to get to that 50 degree mark. Uh, it's highly unlikely, but it is possible, but don't expect it to. And then Sunday, we could get to that 50 degree mark with 50 degrees of mostly sunny skies. And then Sunday, when that storm system does get close to us, we do, however, look to stay dry as I think we will dodge the bullet with this one. Could get to 51, but rather chilly for the weekend, but it is looking quiet as of now. Back to you guys. Well, thank you so much for the weather update there, Eric, and we'll, of course, be coming back to you later for more information. But next up on the docket is a discussion about 
President Biden's agenda. Um, there's quite a few things on the table here, from a hopefully uh, nonpartisan infrastructure bill to a domestic spending bill. Um, a lot of different parts involved in that, between environmental reforms, um, making sure that America's infrastructure and transportation is, um, you know, up to par. Uh, and, and we actually just talked about that earlier in the show in regards to Connecticut. Now we're talking about it on a more nationwide scale where it really does need some work as well. And also, Biden administration is pushing for things like making prescription drugs uh, cheaper, things like that. And there's also possibly some, uh, some other things that we'll see probably later into the year in 2022 that will come up in regards to um, gun control legislation and other things like that. So there's a lot on the table with President Biden and his administration at the moment. And it's called Build Back Better. And it has already been decided upon, uh, the prescription drug policy is in the bill. It's going to stay in there. And Bernie Sanders should be very happy about that, because that was his baby. Climate, we are now spending $550 billion. It was down, it was cut from $650 billion, but it is in there. Uh, Medicare, they have a new hearing benefit, but they cut vision and dental. So those are the things that are in, as well as universal pre-K for three and four years old, and the child tax credit. Absolutely. And it is worth noting that the overall cost of both of these put together, the domestic spending plan, as well as the infrastructure bill, the initial price tag was $3.5 trillion. It's come down now to $1.75 trillion, which uh, is, is a drastic cut. Um, a lot of things have been lost there, but well, some main points are still really, really uh, being involved. And, um, it's, it's all in the name of compromise, and Biden right. realizes that. That's what he said, because they cut paid family leave, leaving us the only superpower in the Western world without paid family leave, and they also cut free community college. Right. Well, we're going to be heading now to a quick story about uh, Biden's congressional agenda, so let's take a look. We're here today with Dr. Jessica Schofield from the Political Science Department at Western Connecticut State University. Dr. Schofield, welcome to Election Connection. Thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Of course. And today we'd like to talk about some topics that are impacting the nation. My first question is, can you clarify for us three areas of the Biden agenda that are being discussed and up for vote in Congress? Sure. So. I'll paraphrase the Biden agenda first, that there's there's three main parts, an emphasis on lowering costs, um, and that's you know mostly for middle class families or lower class families, um, cutting taxes and building jobs. And that can mean just about anything. So three specific aspects that are being discussed in Congress right now, um, along with lowering costs, there's a lot of discussion right now about um, making daycare more affordable. So we know that for working parents, daycare is one of the biggest expenses that they have. It's extremely expensive in America right now. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of discussion about stipends for parents of young children that they can apply to daycare, you know, similar to the, the monthly payments that are given out now, just to try to make daycare more affordable. Um, along with the taxes, so there's an emphasis on cutting taxes for middle class and lower income Americans. But all of this stuff is gonna cost money, so we need to raise taxes somewhere else. So the Biden agenda calls for raising taxes on the wealthiest Americans and wealthy corporations in America. So they're talking about revising the tax code. Um, for example, right now there's a, a cap where if you make above a certain amount of money, you don't have to pay income tax. So raising that cap so that we tax more individuals or possibly getting rid of it as a way to bring in more tax income in the United States to help pay for those programs. And you know, the third emphasis on, on building jobs, we have this you know, Building Back Better plan, but we also have the infrastructure package that's being talked about right now. And if that bill is passed, and right now it has bipartisan support, so we expect it to be passed, then billions of dollars will be pumped into infrastructure projects, which will mean thousands of new jobs for construction workers and for people to maintain that infrastructure throughout the United States. Well, as we just heard there, there's a lot of 
different dynamics and different issues that are part of the bill that are being deliberated right now. And it's something that we need to be really, really careful about and keep an eye on because it does affect a lot of Americans. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to be heading now to a quick update uh, from Jennifer, who's going to be giving us some race updates for local elections. Um, so let's, let's head to the board, Jennifer. Thank you, Jacob. We're going to take a look at where we stand now in the mayoral races. In Danbury, we have Democratic candidate Roberto Alves. He is going against Dean Esposito, who is a Republican candidate. We don't have any numbers for them as of now. Over in Stanford, we are looking at Democratic candidate Caroline Simmons. She is against unaffiliated challenger Bobby Valentine. In the town of Camden, we have some unofficial numbers. Uh, Democrat Lauren Garrett has won the mayoral race with 6,144 votes, as opposed to Republican candidate Ron Gambardello, who received 5,052 votes. Over in West Haven, we have incumbent mayor Nancy Rossi, who is running for a third term. She is against Republican candidate Barry Lee Cohen. As for New Britain, we have the results again, the numbers that we received uh, with Stewart taking a win with 3,312 votes as opposed to Bobby Sanchez who received 2,212 votes. And in New Milford, we have Democratic candidate and lifelong resident Ted Hine. He is against incumbent mayor Pete Bass who is running for a third term. Those are all the updates we have as of now. Back to you guys at the desk. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. Really appreciate all the updates there. Uh, and of course, we're going to be coming back to the races that haven't quite been uh, decided yet. But we do have some breaking news. It looks like Dean Esposito has been declared the winner of his race here in Danbury. So uh, very, very uh, interesting to see that he uh, has, has won and um, looking forward to seeing what kind of policies he chooses to implement during his time. Um, but next up, we're going to head to a quick story here about some more local elections. So let's take a look at that. How important are local elections? Voter turnout in the United States is, is not great, generally. But when it comes to local elections, it can just be downright abysmal. So sometimes in smaller towns, you can have only 10% voter turnout showing up for local municipal elections. And I always tell people that presidential elections are really important too, but the president is not determining what's going on in your town on a daily basis. Instead, those are the people in city elected offices, what we're voting for this November. So municipal elections determine, you know, who gets to be in power to make the decisions about what roads are being paved and what roads are being fixed, where are sidewalks being put in? You know, mm -hmm. are we going to increase the amount of money that parks get? Are we going to add more parks? Are we going to shut down parks? But also the schools, how much money does the school budget have? And those issues have a much more direct impact on our daily lives than presidential and congressional politics do. Um, you know, it's, it affects where we drive, how we get to work, the types of jobs that we have in the town that we live in. So it is very important. And a lot of people don't pay as much attention to it because it doesn't get as much attention nationally. But that does not mean that it's not as important. Municipal elections are extremely important, and everybody should really make an effort to vote in this election um, to make sure that their opinions are being heard in their local elections. You know, Dr. Schofield is so right because it's these local elections that really determine our day-to-day -day lives in our communities. I mean, I don't live up here. Right. I live in New York. However, I was listening to the election in New Milford, and I was like, I want to vote for the extended bike path, because I love the bike path up here. Sure. So that would yeah. really affect my life, but people don't turn out for these local races as they do for the big race every four years. I mean, absolutely. And a huge part of this is how, how much voters care. 
really, and, and, and how um, educated they are on different topics and, and different issues that their communities might face, that their states mm -hmm. might face, and that we face as a country. The presidential election is intensely politicized, sure. right? Yeah. And it's all that everyone thinks about. But even then, we still see, what, 40% of the country doesn't vote in the presidential election, something like that. That's how it's been for the last two elections, which is a massive number. 40% of well, our country doesn't vote, you know? Do you know that in some countries, and I'm thinking in particular in Australia, you are fined if you do not vote. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's almost a duty. That's how other countries see it. Yeah. Um, to participate in the democratic process. And we just don't have that same culture here in America, which is something I think we should cultivate because better educated voters are better voters, all right? But are our voters educated? As of right now, no. No. That's right. why they don't vote in local elections, because they don't see it as incredibly necessary. When in reality it is. With the the um, the critical race theory and COVID um, things we were just talking about in schools and parents being upset about that, that factors directly into local elections. Exactly. Right? Who do you elect even in your town? Things right. like that. Um, so Americans have a duty. They need to participate in their local elections and state elections. They're, they're all very, very important. You can't just try and elect a, a president and uh, expect you know that to go exactly the way you want it. That is a huge reason why we have so much political dissatisfaction in America today. Right, but I think that people feel alienated. People feel as if my vote's not going to count. Right. I mean, this is a big country. But even on a local level, people don't feel like they have any real useful power. And that's a problem. And I think that's one of the reasons that we have become so polarized. Absolutely. Well, on that same note of um, politicizing things and, and getting incre increasingly polarized, we're going to be going now to a story about white nationalism in America. So let's take a look at that. Thank you, Jacob, for the great question. As a matter of fact, white nationalism is something we should definitely be thinking about uh, in, in this current le election and moving forward, too. This is a phenomenon that is as old as our country, and it has been developing for uh, a very long time in its current shape. So uh, I think our particular challenges right now are that we have many small factions of groups that don't necessarily call themselves white nationalists, but uh, when we pull all of those efforts together, it, it does, uh, it, it, we can characterize it all with that label of white nationalism. So some are much more extreme than others. Um, some uh, don't even appear to be white nationalists because they purposefully pull in people of color uh, into their ranks as a strategy. And this is a known strategy as old as slavery, uh, to pull in people of color into the ranks. Again, not to every white nationalist group, but to some. Um, but in particular, the threat to democracy is that these are groups that cumulatively tend toward fascism, and that of course is an immediate threat as we saw in the insurrection uh, on January 6th uh, to the country. In terms of threats to elections uh, and the democracy itself politically, uh, these groups are, are very strategically placing people in positions to gain access uh, to power. Uh, so it is not uh, shocking to, that people have made their way into office uh, by popular vote. Um, and it is not shocking that we even have uh, some people in high positions in, in police work or other agencies uh, that are buying into this. All of this is amplified by social media. Uh, social media it enables people to go off into their separate corners and uh, brew up uh, really conspiracy theories uh, and uh, to complement their ideas with even more over-the-top ideas. Uh, and so that white nationalism in those pockets that are fairly isolated grow uh, and become a greater threat. Uh, so it's something of real concern to this and every election moving forward. And uh, it is absolutely continuing to be catered to by the far right, 
uh, segment of our elected officials, which is deeply concerning. I just want to clarify here real quickly for our viewers that the declaration of Dean Esposito winning his race here in Danbury, that actually came from Esposito's headquarters, not from the Danbury Registrar. So technically, we are still waiting for an announcement on that race to see um, who, in fact, actually won. But uh, white nationalism, we just heard it in that video there. It's uh, something that is spreading across America. A lot of people are very, very concerned about it. And uh, a lot of this started a few years ago, I'd say, you know, probably around leading up to the 2016 election. That's when we saw a lot of people become very invigorated. We saw right-wing politics sort of experience almost a, a renaissance in a way, right? You, you now had the, the almost Mitch McConnell, right, the, the Bush-era Republican, leave the main stage, and what entered was something new, right? Trump was, if you can even call him a Republican, uh, was, in a sense, a, a new kind of Republican, right? Well, he's taken over a faction of the Republican Party. Right. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a new development with lots of new policies, lots of new views, some of which a lot of people are very concerned with. They find them to be uh, discriminatory and they feel threatened by them, right? Well, of course, of course, that's what motivates them, the threat that they will no longer be in power. The, the powerful group that leads or the, is the face of America as they see it. But if you listen to Dr. Bandauer, she said something very important. She said that this is a threat to our democracy. And right. that should send fear down the spine of many people. Absolutely. There is a, a press and you know, line that needs to be drawn, however, between how we actually define these things. Because if you're going to say that something is a threat to democracy, it's a threat to our country, well then, you know, in my opinion, that requires legal action, right? That requires law enforcement to get involved. If people are, are talking about, it's what, it's what we saw happen at the Capitol. Right? I was thinking about the if, Capitol. If people are, 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 are talking about this as a serious, actual threat of violence, it needs to be addressed that way, right. which is why our definitions need to be very, very careful, right? Because we can't be um, calling Americans that um, aren't extremists, calling them extremists. And at the same time, we need to find a balance because obviously we need people um, who are intent on doing violent things to be put behind bars, right? But don't you see that all the topics that we have discussed tonight kind of funnel into this topic now? Right. Because we were talking about the media and how that adds to it. And uh, you look at things like, well, we have politicians now in the Trump area of sure. the Republican Party saying, don't trust your eyes. Those were tourists going to the capitals. Right. So that is a threat to our democracy. Right, and, and the, uh, the media distrust that we were discussing previously. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but I am looking at the man behind the curtain, and I hope everyone else is too. Right. Well, we're going to be heading now to a quick weather update from our student meteorologist, Eric Alf. We are going to get downright cold tonight after a rather chilly day today. And that's going to make way for what could possibly be our first freeze of the season. And if not tonight, then certainly any other night of the week. As that chill does continue throughout the majority of the week. And I am watching closely a potential storm off the coast of southern New England. But it's looking like it's going to miss the area. And I'll get to why in just a bit. Oh, whoops. Huh. There we go. Oh, there we go. So we do have freeze warnings and advisories in effect for the, for the uh, parts of the state. Stanbury is within a freeze warning for tonight, and that's because, again, we do expect temperatures to drop to around 32 degrees, or if not even at that. Temperatures right now aren't too terrible right now. We got 46 in stores, 50 in Hartford, 49 in Danbury, 40 in New York City. But the cloud cover is starting to decrease, and that is going to help temperature, temperatures take a plummet as we go throughout the course of the day. So we got chilly, cold air locked within place of the Great Lakes region and in the Northeast region. But just looking off to the west, we do have warmer air in place, and that warmer air is going to make its way eastward. But it won't exactly stay put as we go throughout the course of the time, and I'll get to why in just a bit. And there's Danbury right there. That cloud cover is starting to move its way out of the region, and we expect that to decrease as we go throughout the course of the night. And if we take a 
broader look of the region. We do see those clouds off the Great Lakes region and as an association with the cold air flowing over the warm lakes, which is causing that air to condense and thus form those clouds. And it's actually forming a few snow showers and rain showers within that region. And then just looking up to the west and south of the Great Lakes region, we do have clear skies ahead. And then just looking further southwest of that is a mass of clouds, and that is an association with a low pressure system down there. And that clear skies is in association with high pressure that will work its way into the region and give us rather pleasant conditions, though we will still be rather chilly for the majority of this week. So what about the timing of those, of those storm systems that I mentioned? Well, here's the low pressure system out in the ocean and high pressure system, strong high pressure system, mind you, dominating the area Thursday night into Friday. And that's going to keep that system away from the region. Now, Sunday is a little bit of a closer call. We have this low pressure center kind of close to the region by Sunday, but we have this high pressure center just off to the southeast, and that's going to bring surge in some of that high pressure off into the northeast, and it's going to keep that storm system away from the coast, I think. So I don't think we will have any rain to deal with for that time period, but it will surge in some northeast winds with this counterclockwise circulation, so we will still be rather chilly, and that warm air from that rise in the jet stream will not make it to our area. We do have moderate colors within the Danbury region as of the November 1st fall foliage report. We expect those colors to go into peak really soon, and then we'll get past peak, so we will certainly have to uh, be aware of that. Tonight, low 33 degrees with partly cloudy skies. An AM, uh, uh, early sprinkle can't be ruled out, and we will be cold flirting with that freezing point. That's why we have that freeze warning in effect from 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning. And Wednesday, we have 49 degrees. That's a high 5 to 15 mile per hour wind, so it will be a little bit breezy with that AM frost and chilly throughout the course of the day, but it will be mostly sunny, so that's good news right there. And then Wednesday night, 32 degrees. It's going to be cold yet again. I do expect freeze warnings to be in effect for that night also. The five-day forecast shows multiple days, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, struggling to get to the 50-degree mark, but we will be dry with partly sunny skies. Thursday and Sunday will be sunny. Saturday will be mostly sunny. Highs getting to 50 degrees. And then Sunday, we get to 51 degrees with those partly cloudy skies. So it is looking dry now for the time being. I expect it to stay like that. So that's good news right there. Back to you guys. Thanks so much, Eric. Very much appreciated. We're going to be going out to one of our field reporters who is standing by. Uh, Kathleen Dowling is going to be giving us some updated race results from Dean Esposito's headquarters. Hello, every. Hello, everyone. This is Kathleen Dowling reporting live from the Amerigo Vespucci Lounge in Danbury, Connecticut. Um, I'm, I'm happy to report that the celebrations are high and energy is exhilarating because we have recently found out that Dean Esposito has won for the 2021 mayoral race for Danbury. As you can see, there is high energy. It's, it's pretty electric in here. They've just been blasting We Are the Champions. It's been a good time. Well, that's fantastic, Kat. Have you gotten the chance to speak with Mr. Esposito at all? Alpha's conceded. We have recently found out. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, now, Kat, did you get the opportunity uh, to speak with Mr. Esposito at all or no? No, we haven't had the opportunity yet. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for all the information. Really do appreciate it. And um, looks, like, uh, looks like a fun time out there. Very, very interesting for sure. Again, thank you so much, Jacob. Of course, absolutely. Um, well, with that, uh, I believe we are still again waiting for the registrars to declare Esposito the winner, but that announcement will most likely be coming in relatively shortly as it appears uh, that uh, his contender did in fact concede. Yeah. So it looks like that race is pretty much decided um, for tonight. But um, yeah, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. And uh, it's, it's, it's great. It's awesome, you know, with all these different races happening. Right. Out, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's exciting. It is. It's great. It reminds me almost of 2020, but not quite as much. No. Um, so with that being said, we're going to head now to our next story for the night. Um, so let's go check out that video and uh, see what is in store for you.
I would define geographic information systems in two words, and that is location analytics. And our crime mapping course covers the theory and practice of this GIS uh, in the context of law enforcement and uh, public safety purposes. All right, so what we do is we start with a theoretical framework for the study of ecology of public safety or crime in place. Um, and, that's, and the descriptive and analytic procedures of crime mapping and how spatial analysis is used in designing and implementing effective programs of uh, crime prevention, problem solving, and community policing. And so what we do is we create the visual part of policy formation. All right, we, uh, we put the points, uh, the crime incidents on the map. We can do all kinds of analytic functions from prediction to probabilities to uh, density to differences in densities to help inform the policy. Criminal justice is uh, very, very uh, political and uh, a platform is, will be based or a successful platform is based on the questions of how we address crime uh, within a certain neighborhood. Now, what we can do is, besides the crime incidents, we can actually map uh, the different parties, the different demographics of the neighborhoods and stuff like that, and then speak to the actual incidents that are occurring within that neighborhood and, and maybe uh, offer plans on how to correct the uh, problem. And so in order to protect people's privacy in uh, geographic information systems, what we do is uh, extract any personal identifying information from the Excel spreadsheet that uh, uh, form the uh, foundations of mapping. And also the street address is usually changed to the nearest street intersection to protect, further protect their privacy. And all the other information is uh, for internal use, not available for public consumption. Well, crime in Connecticut is something that uh, is almost an indicator, as, as one might say, of economic prosperity, right? Uh, traditionally, states, countries, towns, almost anywhere with a, a higher crime rate is going to be one that is um, more economically downtrodden than, than other more wealthy areas. And uh, recently, we've actually seen some changes to Connecticut's crime rate. So Connecticut's overall violent crime rate declined by 1.6% in 2020 um, to 181.6 um, per 100,000 people, right? And that's less than half the national rate. So that's pretty good for Connecticut, you know, less than half the national rate for crime. But our murder uh, rate in Connecticut did actually climb by 30% in 2020 to 3.9 murders per 100,000 people, and these numbers are coming from FBI statistics uh, and Connecticut news junkie sources. Um, that being said, it, it, it is something that, like I said, is an indicator of economic prosperity. It's almost a, a strange dynamic that we have our overall crime weight decreasing, and yet murders are, are going up, you know? Well, you know, that package was interesting to me because it showed how much that they rely on the data. Right. Right? It's not a surmise this, surmise this, which leads us again to these inflammatory thoughts like defund the police or no, strengthen the police. Uh, you know, and you could see that, to, you know, today in the mayoral race in New York City is that we had one of the guardian angels running for mayor of New York City. Right. And that's kind of amazing to me that you would actually have one of the guardian angels who is, you know, their number one priority is crime, right? Yeah. Right, actually being a major candidate to run the city. And and what the guardian angels are is a great example of community policing, really. Mm -hmm. You know, because Big time. Um, it's it's not a man with a badge, right? It right. is it is a, a citizen, and these people are volunteers, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. So it's, it's right. It's something that these people are passionate about, um, but it also does beg the question of, you know. Uh, civilians acting as almost a pseudo law enforcement capacity. Does that worry you? Because to me, I feel like it's a bit of a gray area, right? And I personally, I want law enforcement to be really, really well trained, right? I think, I think they need to be trained to the maximum possible, right? That's an interesting concept because right. the police commissioner at the time when I was teaching at Manhattan College was a graduate of Manhattan College. And he came and said that he believed 
that police, who now I believe only get six weeks of training before they're put on the street in New York, uh, that they should have a college degree. Right. Because right now they don't, and they get paid very poorly at sure. the beginning. Well, we're actually going to be heading now quickly just to some breaking news um, that Esposito has been declared as winning with just 60 votes over Alves. And if that's true, um, there's going to be an automatic recount mm -hmm. for the Danbury race. This is according to News Times. Um, so it's going to be very, very interesting to see um, how this progresses if the recount changes anything. But as of right now, uh, Dean Esposito has won with only 60 votes, a 60-vote margin. That's beyond close absolutely if you want right? to talk about encouraging people to vote yes in in in, in their local elections point. show them something like this right you know these margins are tiny We're, this isn't a national election there's not millions and millions of votes at play you need to get out and vote right because right. this has a huge effect on americans lives right whether it's your governor or your mayor the policies that they pass at a, a close local level are going to have a huge effect on your daily life, whether it be things like infrastructure, right? And we're dealing with in Connecticut right now quite Such a bit. Such a good point. Such a good point. But we have to understand that this is still an unofficial counting of the votes. And it will change. Right. That 60 could turn into something else within the next 10 minutes. Right. It is, it is absolutely true that the recount could, in fact, change things, um, which, again, recount just has to happen because the margin is so small. Right. Um, but uh, with that, we're actually going to head now to a story about the United States Census. So let's take a look at that. It appears that we might have a few technical difficulties. So I think, uh, Dr. Guzda, it might be pertinent to resume our conversation that we were, you know, just having previously about uh, policing and how to best balance, you know, things like uh, organizations like the Guardian Angles, right? And then you have the actual police department in, in and of themselves, right? Right. So in New York City, community policing has always been uh, considered as a way to stop right, yeah. this whole <laughs> dichotomy between the citizen on the street and their hatred of the police and the sure. violence of the police against the citizens. So you had community policing. Yep. Um, and you also had better educated police force. And, um, y you know, things like that, where they made the position of police person more human. Absolutely. Right? Well, we're going to be heading now to our reporter in the field. Kathleen Dowling is going to be giving us some updates. So let's head to the field. Hello, this is Kathleen Dowling with Mayor um, Dean Esposito, soon to be Mayor Dean Esposito. Um, I have a few questions for you. Sure. Okay, so how do you feel? Are you surprised by the outcome of this election? I'm not surprised, but it was very close election. My, my opponent ran a good, strong campaign. I ran one as well. Uh, the people spoke, and uh, it was very close, but it, I, I'm the victor, so thank the Lord. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, what, are, what is your first plan for being mayor of Danbury? Well, once I get sworn in, I'm going to build a, a team around me, which I, I've been the chief of staff for eight years up there in City Hall, working with Mayor Bowen directly and then Mayor Cava. So I really know the ropes. I have a good staff that's already there, but I'm going to evaluate what we need to move Danbury forward and uh, uh, address any issue he, that we need to do. Mayor and obviously one of the recount. biggest issues throughout the Before campaign was the education mayor. and the spacing through the schools. And we've been so addressing that, but we're going to move forward on it even more. Um, another question. Um, your predecessor, Mayor Bowton, was known for working across party lines. Do you plan to continue that in your in your experience as mayor? Absolutely. That's what I've always done. I've been involved in politics for over 30 years. I was a city councilman. And uh, my goal is always to work with anybody that's willing to work with me. And uh, I say, I always say after the election, you're not a Democrat, you're not a Republican, you're a Danbarian. And our focus is on Danbury. And we'll work with anybody that has a good idea to help the city move forward. Definitely. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for letting me interview you. No problem. Thank you. Well, now back to you, Jacob. Thanks so much, Kat, uh, for that quick interview there with uh, Mr. Esposito. Yeah. I, I hope this is not wishful thinking on the Esposito team's part, because still, this election, you have to understand, is going to be contested. 
Right. It yeah. is not official, and right now there's only a margin of 60 votes. Indeed. The way that recounts work is that nothing is declared officially until the recount is actually concluded. And uh, as of right now, that has not happened. Probably won't happen until later tonight. Um, so technically, Mr. Esposito is actually still not yet the mayor of Danbury. And it's just, uh, it might be a formality, but it is important to acknowledge that our report in the field might not have been aware of that. Um, but we just want to clear that up for all of our viewers. All right. However, we're going to be heading now to Jennifer. She's at the board and she's going to give us some updated race results. So let's head to Jennifer. Thank you, Jacob. These are the updates we have as of now for the mayoral race. In Danbury, um, we do have some unofficial results that Dean Esposito um, is taking the lead by 60 votes, although these numbers are to be recounted according to the News Times. In Stanford, we are looking at Democratic candidate and former state representative Caroline Simmons. She is running against unaffiliated challenger Bobby Valentine. In Hamden, we have some unofficial numbers that state Lauren Garrett has won with 6,144 votes, as opposed to Republican candidate Ron Gambardello, who gained 5,052 votes. Over in West Haven, we have incumbent mayor Nancy Rossi, who is running for a third term. Um, she is going against Republican candidate and town council member Barry Lee Cohen. As for New Britain, we have some updated unofficial numbers that state that Bobby Sanchez has received 3,161 votes, as opposed to Aaron Stewart, who has taken a win with 5,318 votes, given her a fifth term as mayor of New Britain. And in New Milford, we have Democratic candidate and lifelong resident Ted Hine, who is up against uh, former mayor Pete Bass, who is seeking a third term. As for our Brookfield Selectman race, we have incumbent Steve Dunn, who is running for a fourth term. He is going against Democratic Tara Carr, who is a 25-year um, veteran who is running for office for the first time. And we have Austin Matero, who is of Independent Party, who is also running for office for the first time. These are all the updates we have as of now. Back to you guys. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Really appreciate that. Now, infrastructure on a national scale, something that we just talked about with President Biden and his proposed spending bill that's currently on its way through the legislative process. But infrastructure in Connecticut is something that really does hit hard on the home front, right? Anyone who has driven a commute through Connecticut, even if they're coming from New York or something like that, or going to New York, right, mm. knows that our roads are, um, well, there's <laughs> there's some infrastructure to be desired. Traffic! Uh, yes. It's always traffic. Lots of traffic. Um, they seem to be working almost interminably on similar spots on I-84. I don't know what they're doing. I hope they're do accomplishing something. But um, it seems as if it, the, the whole process is being dragged out. It's been, it's been this way for years now. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's not good. It, you, you know, when the former Mayor Bouton came to Westcon, and he right. actually hosted our Saturday Night Live type of class, sure. he did the opening monologue. And you can guess what the subject was. It was all right. about the roads and traffic. Right. Right? Yeah. I absolutely. mean, it is a huge problem. I know that when I leave Danbury at five o'clock at night and I'm heading back over 84 and down 684, this is an amazing thought to me. But people just shrug their shoulders and say, this is normal. There's usually a 10 mile backup coming right. towards Danbury. Sure. And it, it makes us incredibly economically inefficient as well worth noting. So we're going to be heading now to a story about infrastructure in Danbury, Connecticut. So let's take a look. Connecticut has been having infrastructure issues. Recently, there have been some constructions that have been happening in the Danbury area that have been taking years, especially on Newtown Road. Connecticut should soon see many more construction projects to come along as soon as President Joe Biden's $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan could transform Connecticut. President Joe Biden's infrastructure plan will be the largest in American history. This plan is designed to fix the nation's crumbling roads, bridges, and railroads while kickstarting the economy at a time when many Americans are still out of work. Some plans that will come to Connecticut would be widening I-84 between exits 3 and 8 in Danbury, I-95 corridor improvements from New Haven to New York, 
improving the interchange at Route 7 and 15 in Norwalk, upgrading the I-84 Route 8 interchange in Waterbury, improving I-95 near the highly congested exit 7 to 8 near downtown Stamford, repairing the northbound side of the Golden Star Bridge in New London, improving the congested interchange of I-91, I-691, Route 15 in Meriden, designing the removal of much criticized traffic signal on Route 9 in Middleton, and many more. Some hope that the plan will help with many problems that are dealt with now that the citizens of Connecticut are complaining about. With our weak infrastructure as 70% of our bridges are over 50 years old, the long-standing complaints about congestion on I-95 in Fairfield County, the proposed tunnel to improve the I-84, I-91 interchange in Hartford, and better street signs for the pedestrians who casually walk on the street. There have been many injuries in the past couple months that involve a four-year-old boy who has been seriously injured after getting struck by a vehicle in Old Lyme who has been rushed to the hospital. Also, two children that were seriously injured after being hit by a car in Torrington, while they were riding their scooters at night. With the new plans to come to Connecticut, we are expecting some major changes to the infrastructure soon, and maybe better road designs for the safety of the drivers and the pedestrians that walk the streets. This is Gabriel Ortiz, WCSU, Election Connection. So infrastructure in Connecticut is something that requires a lot of work. Right? And we're actually seeing the federal government reach out and, and help us a little bit here, which is frankly uh, wonderful to see. You know, um, often they're, they're rather squeamish about that. But Governor Ned Lamont um, is actually applauding President Joe Biden, uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal, Senator Chris Murphy, uh, and a bipartisan coalition of the United States Senate for passing the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The historic legislation will make the largest investment in United States infrastructure in decades, and this is for Connecticut. This is going to help us with certain environmental concerns and adapting more green energy resources. Uh, this is also going to help our, our roads, our bridges, our railroad, and um, one of the goals here is to make sure that our flood mitigation uh, is also up to par because we have fallen behind a lot of other states in that regard. So we need to make sure that's another thing where, again, it makes us economically inefficient. It increases opportunity for unnecessary damages to both homes and businesses, uh, makes travel difficult, right? Right. Right. And travel is very difficult, as we can see on the roads, but let's not forget the railways, too. Right. Right? I mean, we are a suburb of New York City, and if you take the train, it could take you a minimum of two hours to get to work in Manhattan. That I don't have two hours, and I don't think <laughs> anyone else does. That's four hours out of your day. Sure. It, it turns a, an eight-hour workday into really a 12-hour workday, right. um, which is, is brutal. You yeah. know, spending four hours on a train is terrible. I know a lot of people who do that, and, and none of them look forward to it. Right. Um, it's it's it, one of those things that needs to be drastically improved, right? And we should not be, if we want to be, because everyone wants to be, you know, the top dog, right? Everyone wants the United States of America to be, you right. know, the, the, the best country in the world or whatever. We're falling behind many European countries and Asian countries in terms of our, our, our transportation, in terms of our, uh, our infrastructure, right? For sure, and we really need to put the money into that because Absolutely. the plans for the bullet trains and all of that right. down the Northeast Corridor are amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, two hours from Boston to Washington, D.C. Absolutely. Dream come true. Yeah. Well, we're going to head now to a quick story about the United States Census. Let's take a look at that. Why do only 49% of surveyed adults feel that they are accurately represented in the U.S. Census? The U.S. Census, conducted every 10 years, gives insight to our country's diversity and how it continues to change. Census data for Connecticut shows that since 2010, the Hispanic and Latino population has increased while the white population has decreased, a trend that is seen in the overall U.S. population as well. However, there's reason to believe that data on the Hispanic and Latino population may be skewed. Compared to 2010, more people left the race and Hispanic origin question unanswered in 2020. Without this information, the Census Bureau must rely on government records, interviews, and even educated guesses to identify the individual's race and origin. In order to record more accurate data on individuals' Hispanic and Latino origins, changes were to be made to the 2020 census to reframe the question. However, the White House's Office of Management and Budget never publicly approved the proposed changes, 
and they were never made to the census. Framed nearly the same as the 2010 census, the questionnaire asks if an individual is of Spanish, Latino, or Hispanic descent, and then asks their race. Many people of the Latin population do not believe they fit in any of those categories, nor do they consider themselves white. According to the PEW Research Center, approximately 49% of surveyed adults feel that the census accurately represents their origin and race. From the census data, statistics are made about different ethnic groups and races, which are then used by various programs to allocate funds and services to specific groups. The data is also used in research behind civil rights policies. The undercounting of Hispanic and Latino individuals creates inaccurate data and therefore a lack of necessary resources for those groups. Of the 435 seats in the House of Representatives, the census determines where they are distributed every 10 years, a process called apportionment. Several right-leaning states like Texas and Florida gained seats while left-leaning states such as New York lost a seat. While Democrats still hold a slim majority in the House, Republicans may gain control in 2022 after voting district lines have been redrawn. Redistricting data has been released from the census and will be used to draw new voting district maps. Redistricting is controlled by state legislatures in which Republicans have the power to draw the lines for 181 seats and Democrats are only able to redraw 49. As we can see, representation matters for a number of reasons in the case of the U.S. Census. Ultimately, census data has vast downstream political effects, and as the population continues to diversify, the census will likely adapt to more accurately represent the people of our country. This is Sophie Beluzzi for WCSU News Election Connection. Well, some great information there from our video that we just watched. I do have some breaking news, actually. Uh, right now, according to Stanford Advocate, uh, the Stanford mayoral race is a close one. Caroline Simmons, Democrat, uh, has won on the polling machines, but only by a mere 125 votes. And they have yet to count absentee ballots, which could play a huge role in the election. It's worth noting that uh, Caroline Simmons is running against Bobby Valentine, as we mentioned before. So 125 votes, that is a, that is a small margin. Yeah, could easily overturn. Um, and as we're learning now, it, it's increasingly important um, to wait for results to come out, right? right. You know, and wait for these recounts uh, uh, to be finished because they can absolutely change the course of an election. 125 votes, absolutely nothing. You nothing. Know? You get that many people on a one block of Broad Street on a Saturday night. Very true. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to be heading now to a quick weather update um, from our student meteorologist, Eric Golf. We've had a chilly day today, and actually tonight it's going to get downright cold. We could possibly see our first freeze of the season, and if not tonight, then certainly any other night during this week as that chill does continue throughout the majority of this week. And then I am watching a, a storm that will come close to the New England southern coast, but it looks like it is going to miss the region, and I will get to why in a bit. We do have a freeze, wa a freeze warning in effect for Danbury tonight and frost advisories elsewhere and freeze warnings in parts of New York also because we do expect temperatures to get to around that freezing point. And if not at that freezing point, it's going to get pretty cold tonight. The temperatures as of right now, though, are 46 in stores, 50 in Hartford, Torrington, 46, 48 in New York City, 49 in Danbury. So it's not too bad right now, but those temperatures are going to plummet quite a bit as we do see those clouds start to decrease and that insulation from the clouds start to decrease as well. We do have warm air off to the west, and that's because of a rise to the north in the jet stream. But then looking off to the Great Lakes region and in the northeast, we do have chilly cold air locked in place, and that's what's giving us those really chilly to downright cold temperatures, especially into tonight. We will definitely see that. We are starting to see that cloud cover break throughout the Danbury region, and just off to the west, we do have a lot of clear skies now work its way into the region as that cloud cover does decrease. But if we take a broader look, we do see those clouds over the Great Lakes region in association with that cold air 
flowing over the warm waters, which is creating those clouds. And then just looking to the west of the Great Lakes region, we do have clear skies ahead and just south of the region also. But then further southwest of that region is a mass of clouds down by the southern Midwest portion of the country. And that is in association with a low pressure system in that area. And it is producing some rain in the south portion of the Midwest. And that's actually going to be invigorated in the Gulf of Mexico and then stream along the east coast and have some storms come close to our region by the weekend. But they will miss our region. And I'll tell you why right now. We do have strong high pressure locked in place Thursday night through Friday morning. And as that system does creep up along the East Coast, it's going to go off out to sea because of that strong high pressure. But Sunday, that an, another high pressure center is going to be located in the southeast portion of the country. But some of that high pressure is going to make its way into the region. And because of that, we also look to have a miss for this system that's going to push out to sea. And I don't think we are going to see any rain with that either. There's quite a low chance of that happening. But we will see those northeasterly winds from that circulation of the low. So we will keep the temperatures rather cool because of that. The fall foliage report does show Danbury within moderate color and peak color just to the north. And then most of the northeast is past peak. So just be aware of that if you do plan on going leaf peeping, that it is going to end rather quick for the time to come. Tonight we have low 33 degrees flirting with that freezing point. And because of that, we do have a freeze warning from 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. tonight. So be aware of that if you have any pl sensitive plants that you want to bring in and protect. Wednesday, 49 degrees, just barely getting to that 50 degree mark. So we're going to be rather chilly for the course of the day. But luckily, we are going to remain mostly sunny throughout the day with a northwest wind at 5 to 15 miles per hour. And then once night, 32 degrees, we're definitely going to see another freeze warning be issued for the area during that night with mostly clear skies and calm winds. So that's certainly going to help with those temperatures to plummet quite a bit. The five-day forecast shows Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in the upper 40s. So we are just going to struggle to get to that 50 degree mark. It's going to be downright chilly with lows in the lower 30s pretty much throughout the course, the entire course of the work week. The weekend, Saturday, we could see that 50 degree mark. And Sunday, a little warmer with 51 degrees. And like I said, it is going to remain dry as those coastal lows do look to stay offshore. So please don't cancel any weekend plans as for now. Back to you guys. Well, thank you so much for the weather update, Eric. Really do appreciate it. We do have uh, some breaking news now for you. The Virginia governor results have just come in, and it looks as if Youngkin uh, for the GOP has come out victorious with 51.4% of the vote, um, 1,539,938 votes um, over McAuliffe's 47.9%. And uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, quite, quite something here. Virginia is more of a, a purple state now. So really interesting to see uh, the governor election go for a Republican. Um, and uh, yeah. On a yeah. It's, it seems to me like the, it's not only the leaves that are turning red, <laughs> because in New Jersey, uh, the current governor, Bill Murphy, only has 48.39% of the vote, while while re the Republican, Jack Chiarelli, has 50.96%. So the Republican is leading the gubernatorial race in the state of New Jersey. Absolutely. Um, and uh, that is with about 70% of the expected vote currently in. So uh, it's starting to close in for sure on, mm -hmm. uh, on Governor Murphy. Um, so right now we're going to be heading to Jennifer, who's going to be giving us some more updates on different elections and races around Connecticut. Thank you, Jacob. We will begin by looking at the mayoral races. In Danbury, we have some unofficial results that Dean Esposito is taking a lead with just 60 votes. Again, these numbers are to be recounted according to News Times. In Stanford, according to the Stanford Advocate, um, Caroline Simmons has won by 125 votes on the machines. However, there are still absentee ballots that need to be counted. In Hamden, we have some unofficial numbers for Democrat Lauren Garrett, who has won with 6,144 votes, as opposed to Republican candidate Ron Gambardello, who has 5,052 votes. 
over in West Haven, we have incumbent mayor Nancy Rossi going against Republican candidate Barry Lee Cohen. As for New Britain, our unofficial numbers are candidate Bobby Sanchez with 3,161 votes, as opposed to Aaron Stewart with 5,318 votes, making her mayor for a fifth term. And in New Milford, we have Democratic candidate Ted Hine going against incumbent mayor Pete Bass. As for the Brookfield Selectman race, according to News Times, Republican candidate Tara Carr um, is expected to become the first Selectman after defeating incumbent Steve Dunn. That's all I have for now. Back to you guys. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Just to make a quick correction there on the Virginia gubernatorial race. Um, as of right now, currently Youngkin, though he does still hold the lead, the race is too close to call. So just want to clarify that and make sure all of our viewers are well aware of the current situation. With that being said, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight. It is time for our show to come to a close. Um, the crew, thank you all for doing a great job tonight. Dr. Guzda, thank you for joining yeah, us. Yeah, and thank you, Jacob. And thank you for all of the wonderful professors who came on in the videos and talked to us and enlightened us with all of your knowledge. I learned a lot tonight. Absolutely. It is always wonderful to have the Westcon staff production such as this. And thank you all for watching, um, and uh, we hope to see you here next time. Bye. Have a good night.